following is a presentation of Disruption Networks. The Property Sisters of the Mohawk Valley was born when three top producing agents with over 25 years of combined experience selling real estate joined forces to take real estate to the next level. We practice with honesty, integrity, and the knowledge to help make the buying and selling process easy and stress-free for all of our clients. We pledge to always make our clients our top priority from start to finish and even after the house is closed. We will always be a valued resource for information and assistance for our buyers and sellers. Our customers over the years have become not only past clients, but great friends. As we join hands together as the Property Sisters of the Mohawk Valley, we look forward to serving our clients and our community and making a positive difference. You can reach us at 315-601-9630 for all of your real estate needs. When it's your hard-earned money on the line that you are investing into a home, it makes sense to choose a proven professional to assist you in making one of the biggest investments you may ever make. Josh's dedication of over 20 years to the home construction industry allows him to bring knowledge and experience experience to your doorstep. That means you can feel confident and comfortable with his service to you. Past clients love his attention to detail and thorough written reports. By allowing priceless inspections to help you make a well-informed decision concerning your property, you will find that a quality inspection is priceless. Follow Priceless Inspections on Facebook or call 315-525-8725. Hi, this is attorney Nick Pasolacqua. The team of attorneys I have assembled at Pasolacuan Associates has been carefully hand-picked to include the best trial attorneys in the particular areas of the law that we practice. Have you been charged with DWI or any other crime? Members of our team include former assistant district attorneys now fighting to protect your rights 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Have you or someone you love been seriously injured in a motor vehicle accident? Members of the team at Pasolacuan Associates include former insurance defense attorneys, now fighting to ensure that you get every penny you're entitled to. If you need legal help quick, don't waste your time or money calling anyone else. Remember, for legal help quick, you better call Nick and the team at Pasolacuan Associates. 315-500-NICK or 315-500-6425 or visit cnytriallaw.com today. Baseball land. Welcome to the baseline live from Utica, New York. Disruption Network. The D, only on the D right here. It's JP with my co host, SPG. Hey, everybody. Uh, excited to talk some baseball after uh, a week off. Last week we were postponed, like everything else in baseball. But we're back at it Fitting. this week and we are ready to talk uh, two weeks of, of baseball action and updates on uh, standings and league leaders and we're going to be getting to our seventh inning stretch later on today and today we're going to be ranking the top seven shortstops currently playing in the major leagues so stay tuned for that at uh, the tail end part of our show we could play 14 innings with with that one we yeah, could no, yeah no, it was no seventh inning stretch really we could hard like the 14th inning stretch on that one Really hard cutting that down to seven players. I actually, w- we were discussing this a little while Deep. before we went on the air. Uh, I initially had a tie for seventh place, so I actually had eight players because I just could not cut one, and then I ended up uh, adjusting my list a little bit to keep it at seven. But it was tough to pick just seven shortstops because it's – I don't know if, I don't know if I'd say it was it's deep, but – the the high end talent. There are so many good young shortstops in baseball. Well, right see now. the key word there is young, and we could have done, we could have done the list like twenty five and under, and still had a hard time coming up with seven. Right. It, it may have very well been pretty much the same list. Major I mean, League with Baseball a couple exceptions. is in a really good position right now with the, all these young players coming up, um, but. You talk about a deep crop. There's a deep crop at shortstop uh, of just young, mostly under control players, uh, probably on on both of our lists. It's just crazy. There's going to be some big paydays uh, at at number six. 
some big paydays coming up. Uh, we got a lot to get to today. Um, interesting week uh, that was in baseball. Uh, the Yankees are absolutely scorching hot. Uh, not on a tear right now. Not to the dismay of either one of uh, either one of us or Z, uh, who's sitting here with us right now. I'm not complaining uh, about it. I'll tell you that. Definitely not complaining. But we're not going to homer the the hell out of the Yankees' hot streak. But uh, we're going to get to that a little bit. Um, we're going to look at uh, some of the races that we got started up. Also, some of the young talent that is making their impact already um, after getting the call up. You're going to see that going forward with a lot more players uh, getting the call up after uh, the service time clock is, is expired and, and they got a year of control extra. Uh, you know, you're seeing it with the, uh, the Acunas and Walker Buehler's. Uh, exciting stuff. Glaber Torres, of course. Glaber Torres. Glaber. Glaber. Glaber good. It's Glaber good. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting couple weeks. There was some, some injuries and some injury scares. And in, uh, one of the, I-, I guess, almost injuries, because he ended up not missing any time, but I'm, I'm sure the people in Atlanta kind of gasped and were uh, very worried when Freddie Freeman got hit again. Again in the wrist in almost the exact same place that he did last year when he ended up missing, uh, I don't know, what was it, about three months? In the exact same spot. Exact same spot, and he just walked right off the field with a trainer. There was no, well, let's check him out and see if he's okay to stay in the game. It was. It, it looked like it was going to be terrible news I for, texted for you Freeman. immediately when it happened, and I told you that I was watching it on a live look-in, and it looked bad because he, he literally, he didn't do it. He didn't call a trainer out. He didn't wait for the umpire to say, hey, you okay? Take your pace. Nothing. He got hit. He grabbed it, and he walked directly off the field down into the dugout. And I said, this is not good. So the Braves dodged a bullet there. Are the Braves not one of the most exciting teams to watch oh, this they are, yeah. early on in the season? Yeah. Um, so Freddie Freeman ended up not missing any time. Uh, he was fine, played the next day. But, man, what a scare. But, yeah, that, t- that lineup right now is – you know, y- you mentioned young talent, and I don't know that there's any teams that can really match what the Atlanta Braves have on the field and clicking right now for very good top-level young players. Well, once once the Astros kind of won and the Cubs won, you know, even though they're all in their 20s still, you don't look at them like that anymore. They're sure, seasoned yeah. veterans yeah. with a ring, and they're defending title. Uh, you know, they're defending their title this year, the Astros. But, I mean, the, the Astros are essentially that team that the Braves are trying to be uh, with, with the crop of young talent. So we we tend to forget that the, the Cubs and the Braves are very, very, very young. Uh, uh, pardon me, the, the Cubs and the Astros are very young because they've already achieved that uh, that success. But, but you look at, uh, you know, we mentioned Freddie Freeman. He's He's an obvious superstar and has been for a couple of years. Um, Ronald Acuna comes up last Ozzie week. Albies. Uh, Ronald Acuna goes out, hits his first home run. He's, you know, he's hitting all over the place. Uh, Almost hit for the cycle. Living up to the hype so far, and yeah, it's only been a week, but he, and then he is. Uh, that's he's very. Performing. That's very reminiscent of the way, you know, Chris Bryant made that impact when he had first come up, and he was scuffling. Similarly to, I, th- I think Acuna was hitting, uh, you know, in the two teens. Uh, down down in the minors prior to getting the call yeah. up to the big club. Sitting down there discouraged and Absolutely. ready for the next step you in know, his career. In, in, Bryant's, in Bryant's case, it was that he needed to work a little harder on some defensive stuff, um, figured that stuff out, and they brought him up after, uh, like we said, that service time. Uh, they get an extra, extra year of control. Um, you bring him up and he explodes. So you're seeing that maybe with Acuna, you know, small sample size right now, but um, – so Just far, so good. How there. deep that team goes! They're very exciting to watch. Fast, young. Uh, that's a good style of baseball to uh, to want to watch. At least for me, anyway. Um, the Atlanta Braves. Watch out for the Atlanta Braves. Yeah, and you maybe, mentioned right? Ozzy Albies, and he he is still on fire. We we talked about him a little bit last show a couple weeks ago, and he's just continued rolling on and hit another home run, had a double today, uh, stolen base. He's he's just piling up the stats right now and when we, when we go through the league leaders in a little bit don't be surprised if you see Ozzy Elby's name uh, on there. Ender and Ciarte was a home run away from the cycle today uh, with a stolen base and a couple runs scored um, for their top of the lineup guy. Um, you know the Braves 16 and 11 right now game and a half behind the Mets um, six and four in their last 10. 
Um, pretty even splits home and away. Uh, it, you're looking at a young team. If a young team can sustain that type of thing, you might see like a Minnesota Twins. Maybe they sneak into the back, uh, the back like the Minnesota Twins ended up doing last year. Maybe they end up with that second wild card, the Braves. Um, you don't think maybe that that pitching staff's going to hold up uh, for the duration of the year, but who knows? Uh, the Nationals aren't really living up to the hype in that division. No, I wonder what the kind of leaving it wide open. The Nationals are four and a half back right now of the Mets, Braves, and Phillies all right now tied. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, Phillies and Atlanta are a game and a half back. They're tied, and then the Mets are uh, up in first place still. Um, so wa- Washington's six games behind them right now. 12 and 16 start. Three and Washington. seven in their last ten. And yeah. that's that's a team that we all just – or at least most of us did. We we just kind of put right at the top of the standings when is we were going through. Is Martinez feeling a squeeze? You think? Uh, probably not yet. But you know, in a month or so from now, if they haven't jumped back up towards the top of that division, I mean, not even necessary f- necessarily first place, but if they're not up there with Atlanta and Philly and gaining ground on the Mets in, in a few weeks to a month and from now, then uh, then absolutely, uh, you know, y- you'll start hearing that uh, that frustrated crowd because the expectations for that team are, are out of this world. Not only the expectations of what that team is supposed to do, but who you just said that they need to keep pace with is not the position that the, the Washington Nationals th- thought they'd find themselves in. Um, you know, you look at that division coming in, to, if you're an executive in Washington, you look at the division coming in and you got to feel pretty confident with 19 games against the Braves, 19 games against the Phillies, and 19 games against the Miami Marlins. You got to feel really confident in the way that you're going to prepare and approach your schedule that you're probably going to grab a bunch of series right in your division. Um, but it doesn't look that way anymore. Uh, and that's not a knock against what the Phillies did this offseason because both you and I have spoken very highly of the Phillies um, and, and the process that they're going through and the pieces that they've added. Um, you know, never thought that they were going to be this good yet. Um, same thing with the Braves. D- who thought that they would gel and be this exciting uh, this early? Certainly not the Nationals. They didn't think that. And so sitting here four games under five hundred, and end, Ma- er, end of April, um, looking into May and, and – really looking at the rest of your division being competitive, more competitive than you had thought. Yeah. You know, the panic button might get hit pretty quick for him. Um, you know, we've already seen one manager get the ax, and not to put the national situation anywhere near what, what the Reds were experiencing, but it, it does happen, and he should be weary. You're losing to teams that, that you're not supposed to lose to. You're 3-7 and seven in your last 10. You've got arguably on paper – the best lineup in the game. Adam, Adam Eaton's is, is out. He's been out. Um, obviously, that's a table setter type guy that they, they need to utilize He's more. He's a big part right? of that lineup. So it's a cog. And, you know, Daniel Murphy is out. Understandable, but still, with that pitching staff and that bullpen, which was the need that the Washington Nationals needed to address, right? And they go out and they get the guys to address that need. And it's just not – it's not happening right now. It's not gelling. Now, it's not – I mean, 12 and 16, it's not necessarily the end of the world. The Yankees sat – you know, they hovered back and forth 9 and 9, 10 and 9, 10 and 10, and then they just exploded. Right. All right? So it, it happens. And today right? we, we are exactly one month into the season today. Opening day was one month ago today. Uh, I wouldn't be – extremely worried right now about the two Washington months. Nationals. Two months. If this if this trend, you know, if we're back here and they're they're 24 and 32 at the end of May. But that being said, the, the pressure is on now. The pressure right. is on. The worry might not be there, but the pressure is mounting. Yeah. I I totally agree with you. Um, Speaking of uh, of the Nationals, uh, w- one of my favorite highlights of uh, this I, th- I think it was probably uh, a little over a week ago now was uh, the Bryce Harper uh, broken bat home run. Shatters his bat and still is able to go yard. I, I don't know if you saw that highlight, but that was that was a special kind of strength. Pretty right? cool to see, yeah. Something you, you rarely ever see happen, and that was, uh, that, was, that was one of my favorite highlights so far in this, this young season. Uh, one of the other cool moments that happened, uh, which is probably my favorite moment, especially non-Yankees related, uh, so far this season is uh, the 
Indians and Minnesota Twins played a couple games in Puerto Rico. And Francisco Lindor hits a bomb in the second game. And just seeing the energy and the excitement of that crowd in Puerto Rico, seeing Francisco Lindor go yard, you know, after everything that uh, Puerto Rico has been through with the hurricanes and, and, and all that came with that and, and rebuilding, uh, you know, a majority of the, the facilities and the infrastructure in the country, um, you know, it's been, been tough times down there. And, uh, and what better way than sports to kind of lift, you know, the spirits of people um, you know, you go back to looking at, you know, 9-11 when the Yankees were out there and they were competitive and made the World Series and just... Mike Piazza's home run, same same type yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And just, just the, the, you know, times where people just need that distraction and something to give them joy. Listen. And, man, they, they went absolutely nuts. We like both know that baseball in Latin America is religion. It's... it's I couldn't agree with you more. It's a wonderful sight. Um what would you say if I asked you, um, you know, we've we've both listened to what Rob Manfred has had to say about the future of the game and and the direction that he wants it to go, uh, not necessarily insinuating that expansion was going to happen, but almost, you know, kind of read between the lines that that expansion would be would be talked about anyway. Um, if baseball were to expand. By let's say two teams, because you know some some place in in the mainland United States is going to get a team, right? If baseball right, were to m- expand, yeah, Montreal. Do, could you see could you see Puerto Rico getting a team? Uh, that's tough to say. Uh, they would need you know obviously a state of the art baseball facility down there uh, in order to stay with major league standards. So that's the first hurdle. And if they were somehow able to build a facility that was major league quality um it's it's not like travel would be crazy to go to i mean it's not that much different than going to miami you know if you're you know flying from new york to miami or new york to puerto rico i mean what there's really not that much of a of a difference there as far as travel goes um it would really just be infrastructure and a major league ballpark that would be able to support major league baseball the fan support's there. I mean, that that's not that even... That wouldn't even be a question. That's not even a question. It wouldn't even be a question. The, the passion's It there. would lead in, in sell-out percentage. It might not be... It might not lead at the gate because it might not be the biggest stadium in the league. Sure, but, yeah. Um, you know, it would probably have a record amount oh, of it, sellouts. There, yeah, it'd be in, infinite sellouts. Uh, the fan support's not even a question. And especially when, you know, your Lindors or, or some of these other Puerto Rican superstars go down there and play... Carlos Beltran, the first manager of uh, of the San Juan, the San Juan Saints. Yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, there's a long ways to go. I think before that would even be a possibility. But uh, I wouldn't be against it if they were able to provide, you know, all of the major league requirements as far as facilities. Just and because that atmosphere is something that I think the game needs, and I also think that uh, you know a more international appeal. Um, is is kind of necessary uh, going forward for the game because the game is a global game. Um, so you mentioned Montreal. I think Montreal would go nuts. Look at look at. I mean, granted they were Toronto Blue Jays fans, um, but maybe they're just Blue Jay fans by default in in Montreal nowadays. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the you know that that game that preseason yeah preseason. Listen to me, um, that um, spring training game that drew a lot of fans. And there was a really cool moment in that one too. A, a really cool Vladimir signature Guerrero home Jr. run. Junior, Vlad Junior hits a home run, and the place went nuts there. And too. so maybe that signifies, you know, baseball uh, resurging in Montreal. And the Expos have been gone for a long time now. So you figure, you know, those those kids, you know, say your twelve year old to sixteen year old, uh, you know, sports fan, baseball fan, just really getting into playing baseball seriously or watching baseball seriously and being a fan and and wanting to attend games but you know no major league team in the city anymore you figure a lot of those kids yeah the old guard might still be no we're at montreal expos fans but the kids are probably all toronto blue jays fans there now you know and getting a team there would you know get that montreal fan base their own team back where you know they'd have their own team to root for but that was a that was a cool moment and 
I wouldn't be surprised if someday Montreal is back in the major leagues. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Obviously, they have a, a stadium that they'll need to build there as well. Um, Something about the feel of Olympic Stadium, though. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the old school it's, feel it's, of Olympic Stadium is kind of cool. It's that nostalgic, circular though. monstrosity. Yep, the cookie cutter. <laughs> cookie cutter from back in the, the, the day. Yeah, the, uh, the Three River Stadium and... Uh, uh, what it, uh, Atlanta, Fulton uh, County, Fulton County Stadium. What was the one in, uh, uh, in Riv- Cincinnati? Riverfront Stadium, Riverfront, Cincinnati. There you go. Riverfront. It changed so many times that one. It, it ended up being Synergy Field. I think was the last thing. The one thing I remember about Synergy Field was always in the summertime when it was like July. A Riverfront Synergy. They would always hang the thermometer in the dugout because of the the astroturf in there and how absolutely insanely hot it got. Uh, you know, 115 degrees, 120 degrees on the field. Uh, guys, spikes were melting. It's just insane, the cookie-cutter stadiums that, you know, you show those to kids that are 16, 17 years old and just getting into being a fan of the game, and they'd say, wait, they played baseball in these things? <laughs> you know, because now the ballparks are – there. and we talked about our seven, uh, our seven favorite ballparks, but all the new ballparks that are have been made in the last 20 years are just cathedrals. Um, green grass, dome stadiums, all the smart ones anyway. Um, imagine what kind of scheduling conflicts they could avoid with everybody having a retractable dome, right? I don't know. It would have made a huge difference. It seems like, the, you uh, know, you've already committed. Uh, well, there's I, some know, places I never, never want to see. Five million to the project or whatever. You know, could we do without the Regal Concourse maybe and <laughs> and, you know, Throw the roof, throw the roof on, perhaps, so we can play games in April. Yeah, but there's some places you still don't want that though. You don't want that at you know Yankee Stadium. You don't want a retractable roof. You don't want to see Boston with one. So yeah, more cities should do that, but you can't do it in Chicago and Boston and New York, in my opinion. I don't know. I mean, you could probably design something that's, you know aesthetically inconspicuous kind of just you know hovers above the stadium someplace it, some of them are are done <laughs> very well you know it's not it, it, nothing against rogers center the sky dome in toronto but no they're all not rogers you're yeah, right. they're it, all not the sky dome. a lot of them are built to look like old school ballparks and the the roof is uh you know it's, it's obviously there and covers during uh inclement weather or, or whatever but it's not like such an obvious thing on some of these days when they have the roof open uh, Safeco Field being one of them, uh, Miller Park. Miller Park, they, they just built that stadium, and that stadium is falling, literally falling apart. There's pieces of the roof falling off, and what a sh- what a shame. That is Brewers a shame. are already talking about. I mean, they don't show up in support. Uh, big feud about that too. Uh, this a Twitter fight between uh, Brewers fans and Cubs fans. It was great, <laughs> and and you know. Brewers fans being disrespected by the Cubs fans in terms of uh, their attendance support of, of their team. Definitely no so, love lost there. I mean, that's not you, you know your your Boston Red no. Sox New York Yankees rivalry, but uh, yeah, that that are those are a couple fan calling bases it now four twenty nine. Not We're a fan of each other. Calling it right now, Cubs and Brewers in at least one bench clearing brawl this year. They play a lot too. At least they'll one. have a lot of chances to do at it. At least one game. I got a one out of nineteen shot right. Unless they both make the playoffs together, and then that'd be even better. So you, you said you're not going to see one in the playoffs, though. Four twenty nine. Four twenty nine. Uh, that reminded me too. Uh, completely different topic, but oh, all right. April twenty ninth, nineteen eighty six. This date in baseball, Roger Clemens becomes the first major league pitcher to strike out twenty batters in a game against the Seattle Mariners. Did it twice. Ended up doing it twice. Yep. <laughs> Did it twice. And that was the first time in major league history that happened. Um, See, 30, 32 Roger. years ago today, April 29th, 1986. Skinny Roger. That's a Cy Young year, I believe, 1986. They made the World Series. Or no, 88, they go to the World Series. No, 86 against the Mets. Yeah, 86. Yep. Yeah, they go to go against the Mets. It was the Bill so Buckner, that's his, Mookie uh, Wilson year. That's a Cy Young year. Not that it's really hard to pick out a Roger Clemens Cy Young year. There were so many of them. I think he won six, right? Um, but that's what I think is probably his signature year is 1986 anyway. Hated him back then, absolutely. Oh hated yeah, him. yeah. Him and, and I loved Fox. him. I loved him when he was a Yankee because they won. You know, 
Same, um, with, same with Wade Boggs. You, you can put him right in that same category. I could not stand Wade Boggs when he was on the Red Sox. And he comes to the Yankees, and you know he's out on the field on a on a horse, riding the horse, riding the horse after winning the World Series. And uh, he's quite the character, Wade Boggs. If you've never read up on uh, some of his off the field activities, or how about <laughs> his pre field activities? Uh, ate the, ate the same meal before. Yeah, fried every chicken every single, single day. Game. Right, fried chicken, and I think Miller Lite. Listen, it doesn't. It, you could be a strange the Wade bird. Boggs diet. You could mm-hmm. be a strange bird. But if you're gonna you're gonna get three thousand base hits, all right, you're gonna be a, a career three hundred hitter. His on base is probably close to I gotta look up Wade Boggs' stats now. His on base is probably close to somewhere around four hundred. All right, gotta be yeah. Right, you get you eat whatever you want, have whatever you want. You want to eat the same? You want to eat KFC every day? Be my guest. <laughs> here's your paycheck. Here's your glove. Go do what you gotta do. I wonder how many other players started doing that. Like, wow, it works for Wade Boggs. We got to start eating more fried chicken. Oh, I'm sure there's more <laughs> more quirks about players that we would never even be privy to, never. But I'm sure that there's a ton. Um, Four fifteen career on base percentage for Wade Boggs. Okay, yeah, eat eat as much <laughs> chicken as you want. Yep, that's what fried as chicken m- does for you. As much as you want. Um, Wade Boggs, that, that's a that's a pretty good example. I hated Johnny Damon. Oh yeah, he was. But I didn't one. hate Johnny Damon when he was an A, and I didn't hate Johnny Damon when he was a Royal. I I loathed Johnny Damon, bearded Johnny Damon, Captain Caveman Johnny Damon. I hated him. He was he was like the face. He was yeah he, he was, was the he face. was their team leader at the I time. Hated him. That and he would just absolutely work pitchers over. For those years, those were his formative years. I mean, he had a couple good years at, at the end of it, and prior to that, um, you know, he had a couple with the Yankees, and then a couple uh, leading up to that Boston spurt. But Boston was his, you know, that's his signature part of his career. And man, could that guy go deep into account and just foul pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch? I hated him. <laughs> but then he came to the Yankees, and I loved him. Um, he's he's that type of player. Um, but most – there ain't a whole lot of – I mean, I guess there's a lot, and somebody's going to provide me with a list somewhere out there, I, I, I would bet. But I can't think of a whole lot of superstars that played for both. Not in my lifetime. There's not anyway. too many. I mean, not ob- in my obviously lifetime. Babe Ruth I mean, is there's the, some role the name players. that comes to mind. Kevin Euclid never really played. He was a superstar for a few years in Boston, um, but never really played an integral integral role with uh, with the Yankees. Uh, David Cohn and kind of comes to mind too, where he he went to Boston, but that was end of his career after and and David Wells too um, yeah. after his the the prime. I don't of his really career. even identify David Cohn as a Yankee. No, I look at him as, as he's a terrible broadcaster. As a Met, he's a terrible broadcaster. Royal, so can we talk about David Cohn for a second? Because you probably <laughs> listen to David Cohn as much as I do. Just tell the story of the game, David. Just, just the game. Stop Speaking with, of stop Yankees with the analytics, man. Speaking of Yankees broadcasters, and, and a good one this time is uh, I'm I'm kind of bummed that Ken Ken Singleton's uh, retiring after this year. I think he is definitely one of the better ones, and he's he's been around for a long time now, and he'll be missed calling Yankees games for sure. Yeah, well, his voice, Ken Singleton's voice has personally put me to nap state at least 100 times in my life. <laughs> Seriously. In a good way, in a, in a total good way. In a very just, soothing just way. Just sitting there on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Typically, it would probably be an away game at Baltimore or something because that's well, you know Ken Singleton's going to Baltimore for sure, and you know Ken Singleton gets the West Coast trips for sure because uh, Michael Kay doesn't travel, so or he doesn't fly, I don't believe. Um, Ken Singleton, man. There's nothing better than a nice, warm, cool breeze coming through the window July afternoon. And Ken Singleton rocking you to sleep. Ken well, Singleton just, and Paul O'Neill calling just, a game. Listen, right that's the dream team for Yes right now. Right there. That's lo- the I'm, dream team for Yes. As Paul much as O'Neal I love is, Paul O'Neill as is, is a player, as a former player, a, one of my he, all-time favorite players of all time. Me too. 
Um, I had I still have a Paul O'Neill jersey that I got when I was like 15 years old that I, I still somehow fit in. I must have got a really huge one like the style was back in the day. Just get like a big baggy shirt and it, it paid off because it still fits me. <laughs> I still have my Paul O'Neill jersey from back then. Um, but he is really good at color commentary during a game. I love uh, listening to Paul O'Neill's commentary um, during Yankee broadcasts and and a lot of times he is paired up with Ken Singleton, and they make for for a good good on air duo. Um, and it, you know, it, say what you will about the regular cast of characters of Yankee broadcasters, because uh, they're very polarizing, uh, a, a very polarizing group. Your your uh, Susan Waldman's and well, John Sterling's and Michael K's. I happen to not mind, and we we've, we've discussed this on the show before. I happen to not mind John Sterling. The home run calls are getting absolutely out of control now. Their whole sentences and they like some of it. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. He's great. And that's a T-shirt type thing. They can put that on a T-shirt. All rise. That was that was John Sterling. It's perfect. And it's on a it's on a T-shirt. Nobody came up with that. And I'm sure somebody may have come up with all rise. But that was John Sterling. He's had some really that's, good ones to give him credit. Like he really uh, does. Melky Cabrera was always a good one. The milkman delivers. And John Sterling doesn't give a score. He, and it drives me bananas. There's been multiple bananas. times over the last couple of years where I'm listening to a Yankee game in my car, and uh, say the Yankees are at bat, and it's like, uh, and it is high, it is far, and oh, it's, oh, it's off the wall, it's caught at yeah, the warning it's, or track, or caught, yeah. Or the Listen, other team is up, and it's like, and he flies one to left field, and it's gone. It's like, really, come on. <laughs> I get it if you're a TV broadcaster, you know, at least you give the benefit of somebody seeing what's happening. But when you're a radio only guy, I mean, you got to be really, really descriptive and really good and really on top of your stuff. And I don't know, he's he's going downhill even more than uh, than than he was prior. Like the last couple of years really stick out. I don't think that honestly, I don't think that he can see. Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised so, by uh, some of his calls. But jo- I mean, John Sterling's a, uh, he's he's a Yankee legend, so I give him his respect, honestly. Uh, but you know, Susan Waldman, I don't have a problem with Susan Waldman. Um, a lot of people, you know, clearly her voice is a little, you know, geographic, it's unique. It's geographic, we'll <laughs> it, and it's very New York, and that's just the way it is. But her knowledge of baseball is. Unparalleled. Oh, there's no doubt in that, and same with John Sterling too. I'm not saying he's not knowledgeable, I'm, and he's got a great radio voice. On you know, unlike Susan Waldman, you know, the, what you think of a traditional radio voice, but use use that voice and call a good game. Yeah, well, tell the story <laughs> on the field. I agree. Um, but speaking of you know female broadcasters, Susan Waldman is is part of a really select group that have called national TV broadcast. Uh, as a woman uh, in Major League Baseball. And this week, uh, we actually added to that that sorority uh, of women. Um, and Jenny Kavner uh, broke through by calling a play-by-play on uh, Monday's uh, Colorado Rockies broadcast, uh, becoming, I believe, only the, like the sixth woman uh, to ever call uh, a nationally broadcasted TV Major League Baseball game. Um, so Jenny Kavner, awesome way to go. Um, it's probably not an easy thing. I, I'd actually probably like to go back and listen to uh, pieces of it if I can, uh, because it's it's probably not very easy to do uh, the play by play. I've never been in that position. I don't know if you have even at the little league level or I anything like no. that. Um, it's probably not an easy thing to do. Tell oh, the story sure of the game not. and also fill in the dead air because you can't have the dead air. Um, you know, but good for her. Um, and good for women like Susan Waldman. I honestly, I have no problem with Susan Waldman's knowledge of of the game of baseball. Um, so it says here that uh, she she joined Gail Gardner and Jessica Mendoza, who's right, cur- yeah. currently um, broadcasting the game the as we speak. I believe the broadcasting Yankees and, the uh, Yankees and Angels. the Angels right now. Um, so it's something that I really like um, to see, and I'd like to see more of is the female broadcasters. Kind of breaking off that sideline reporter uh, type, you know, label, you know, the, the pretty face on the sideline and really getting into the guts and teeth of the game and and calling it. And and so, I don't know, way to go, Jenny Kavner. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I agree completely. Uh, you know, if you're a knowledgeable person about baseball, 
gender shouldn't matter. And people like Susan Waldman have helped break through that barrier a little bit. And uh, Jessica Mendoza in you know the the one this past week as well and it's good to see you know and man or woman doesn't matter if you're knowledgeable and you can call a game because like we said it it's a complete different animal being on a sideline or in a dugout and giving an update here and there and then having a long break to kind of get your thoughts together than being on the air constantly and having to call every single pitch and every single play and you know and be accurate on all of it as you're watching it and then throwing in you know, baseball knowledge that's uh, that's good for your listeners to to kind of soak in and and see where you're at with your baseball knowledge. But uh, yeah, that that is great, and I agree completely that uh, it's nice to see that that's that's starting to turn a little bit. We got Dave checking in. Uh, what's going on, Dave? Um, Dave wants to know if relations continue to thaw in progress. What about a team in Cuba? Um, it's interesting that you say that because I was kind of going to segue a little bit into that earlier when we were speaking about Puerto Rico. Um, one of my all time like bucket list type things is to watch a game, an industrialist game in Estadio Nacional in Habana, Cuba. Uh, it's, it's honestly one of my like ultimate like fantasy bucket list uh, type goals is to watch a baseball game at, at the national stadium in, in Havana. Um, you want to talk about what a, a rabid fan base that you would instantly have? Yeah. Everything that we said about Puerto Rico, you can apply to Cuba and probably then some, and I it's mean, almost like they don't even, they wouldn't even need to start fresh. Like the, the Rockies and the, um, and the Marlins did with the draft. Right, and, all the and, players like, that are in Cuba just, right listen, now. Listen, just, just take – exactly. <laughs> like, they get dibs. First first and foremost, they get dibs on their own players, and they can build a team that they feel – but it, they don't – it could just be industriales. You don't even need to <laughs> – we don't need to create a franchise, nothing. We're just going to – industriales, and we're going to take on everybody. Put us in the National League East, and you know – It'd be so, funny. It'd be funny to see what would happen with that because you know usually you hear about an expansion team becoming official and then you got like a, a couple of years wait while they, you know, finish their stadium or build their organization or their minor league levels. It would be interesting to see if any Cuban made, uh, you know, Cuban league players, you know, your Yasiel Puigs and Cespedes types that are playing in Cuba right now, if that would just stop completely and them being like. Nope, we are going to wait until uh, the Cuban team is ready to go. We're going to have no signings for two years, and we're all signing with Team Cuba. They could put a team together right now with guys that – just the guys we know, they could put an all-star team together Oh yeah, right now um, with just the, the, the known guys. Because you and I don't – I mean, I don't know what you're doing in your spare time, but I don't know the, the happenings with the Cuban League right now. <laughs> Cuban you know, league and, and who knows right? which uh, you know what Cuban players might be in the in the in the minors right now too that are just kind of working their way up that aren't your superstar types or but. they're in Venezuela or Mexico or listen the international flavor of the game is where our national pastime is headed it just is yeah so it's exp- already there, expansion really. outside of our borders is imminent and it it's a great thing uh, you know what if the future of baseball holds a sixty league team with one series home and away just like they do right one series home and away with the outside so you would have the major league baseball and perhaps like an international league and then at the end they play in the playoffs you know i mean like teams from china teams from japan i wouldn't and you know obviously travel would be a concern so you wouldn't do that that much there's a there's a big difference. Uh, I but, mean, you hear you hear some rumblings uh, w- with the NFL with maybe wanting a team in London someday or Mexico City, uh, but there is a huge difference to what a baseball uh, international team, whether it be Puerto Rico, Cuba, Mexico, uh, you know, wherever you want to say, huge difference because NFL players, the you know, the majority of them are all mostly american so that would be a true foreign you know experience except for, for that one australian guy that got drafted yeah yesterday. there's a yeah there's a couple i saw yeah i saw that guy <laughs> he was throwing people all over the place there's a couple there. and there's a few canadians mixed in there and, sure you know there's there's some international football talent out there but it is there's a lot of international football talent out there but it's called football right and yeah right there's there's a ton of that 
not much American football talent. Agreed. Internationally. Agreed. Because it's an you know it's baseball started as an American game too, but uh, they're like you said that a, a lot of the the major league baseball players right now are you know your your Cuban, Puerto Rico, uh, Mexico, Curacao. Um, y- there's a lot of top level talent from all those places. So, so Dave, if you're out there listening right now, Mister Stat Dave. Um, why don't you let us know the percentage right now of international players to homegrown uh, American players? I, I'm kind of curious. Let's see if he can find our that s- one out. Our remote statistician. Our remote Dave statistician. Dave um, Rowe. So we're going to, in a little bit here, get into an uh, uh, overview of uh, where Major League Baseball is right now as far as standings go. Uh, we'll talk about some league leaders. Um, but one thing I do want to talk about before we get into that is – Instant replay, and I am getting so Oof. sick of baseball's version of instant replay. I I can't even I can't take it anymore. Last week the Yankees and uh, Blue Jays game, Tyler Austin gets called out. It wasn't even close at first base. It was not even close. It was a a foot, maybe foot and a half. Blatant. Blatant. So they go to review it, and you're kind of thinking at the time, like, okay, well, you know, this is what replay is for. They'll go review it, and they'll get the call right, and they'll come back, and Tyler Austin will be on first base. And they reviewed it, and somehow the review came back is that he was still out. I have no idea who was reviewing Wait, that. It was. You're not exaggerating when you say a foot. Oh yeah, go it go, go look foot. it up. Search for Tyler Austin uh, instant replay, and you'll you'll find videos of it. But it was. It was terrible. Uh, that call was ridiculous. And Major League Baseball has this, you know, big initiative right now, whether you agree with it or not, to shorten games and, and make these games go a, a little quicker. You know, pitch clocks in the minor leagues and the talk of pitch lo- uh, pitch clock in the majors and this year's new rule of limiting mound visits. And then you're going to go and have this shoddy instant replay system that just negates all of that stuff you're doing. So w- what's the point of trying to shorten the game when you're going out there and you're reviewing these calls and you're still not getting them right? You know, leave it up to the umpires. Let the umpires do their job. And I don't agree with completely getting rid of instant replay. I think there are a couple very rare scenarios where, a few rare scenarios where it should it should be in the game. That being fair or foul on a home run, you know, reviewing whether a a ball hit the the fair pole, foul pole, um, and fan interference to see if, you know, a fan touching the ball on a home run or, you know, even like a a double down the line or something, uh, the ball was in the field of play when they touched it because it would change where the base runners go. Sure. Um, Those two scenarios are the only time you need instant replay in baseball. Otherwise, just let the umpires do their job, and right there, you're cutting down on a lot of that need for this pitch clock or these mound visits being limited. Y- that helps your your main goal of shortening games a little bit instead of having the umpires come out with their, you know, their equipment sitting there with their headsets on and just stare looking around and doing nothing. And okay, here comes the review from New York, and okay, safe or out. You know, get rid of that. Get rid of it. It's who does Aaron Boone or anybody Terry Francona? Who do they come out of the dugout and argue with at that point in time? The Tyler Austin right. thing is one. Um, you know, forgive the the second Yankee game reference uh, about this instant replay, but the Cole Calhoun play um, earlier uh, in this series with the Angels, uh, the first game. Yeah, there um, was a play with um, Chris Taylor of the Dodgers uh, stealing a base, and he ended up eventually getting called. Out, even though there was really no evidence to overturn the call last week, same night as the Tyler Austin call, I noticed that one too. And that, I, I just don't. I Cole Calhoun don't get it. Um, made a catch up against the wall. Giancarlo Stanton presumably tagged up and left in in the right frame of time. Was uh, was all good with that, and they called him out. They called a double play. Um, but they let Didi Gregorius score. Didi Gregorius had scored before the double play had occurred. Um, and so the question was if Cole Calhoun had caught the ball, that's what they go and review. They review if Cole Calhoun had caught the ball because clearly in the replay you can see that Giancarlo Stanton left after he had caught the ball, so that was legal. 
So it shouldn't have been a double play. But also, you can see that Didi Gregorius did not cross the plate before the double play, yeah. was, even though the double play was wrong. He was about a foot short of scoring. He hadn't point. crossed at the point of the double play. So what the hell are you looking at? What are you in there, in that booth in New York City, wherever you are in Times Square, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? It's almost as if there's a bewilderment as to the rules of the game or, or the outcome of what they're looking at or what they're, they're looking for because you can't miss all of those things. And if you're going to review one thing on the play to get the outcome of the play right, not all the plays that you're going to go and review are going to be you know, pickoff moves to first base. And what are you reviewing? You're reviewing the catch and the tag, right? That, that's, that's the review. But if you're going to review you know, a catch and a tag up, and a guy tagging up from third and scoring as a double plays. If you're gonna, you gotta review all portions of it. You can't just go see if Cole Calhoun made the catch. You gotta review all the portions of the play or none of the play. Why take that time and get the wrong, or or completely different outcome than what it should have been? It's just not right. So I, I mean, I totally agree with you. The Tyler Austin thing was like, are you kidding me? We're watching. You're robbing the fans at that point in time. I'm sorry. You're not helping. That's. You're making the game less engaging for me. I don't want to watch it at that point in time. I want to throw something at the TV, and I want to get the hell out of the room. <laughs> For- because Fortunately, that didn't uh, affect the outcome of the game. No, but, but it could have. But that's not, the point. That's that not the point. It could have. That's not the point at all. The point. Um, it's, it's less engaging for a fan when he knows, you know, that's the beauty of being a fan in 2018 where we got the benefits of above head replay. and over, Like, we got nine angles, and that's the way that we grew up watching the game. So when we watch and we know that he's clearly safe, you know, those were those were tough pills to swallow pre-replay, right? Tough pills to swallow. You watch it and you're like, oh, he was safe and right. the guy got it wrong. But Darn you're, kind, you're kind of, okay, oh, Joe West, how could you miss that one? That ump is blind today. We're getting screwed by the <laughs> umps, right? But now you have a system in place as a check and balance on that mistake. And to still come back with the wrong verdict is just just insane. Uh, it's It's just crazy. Uh, So we got Dave checking in again in reference to the international player question that I had asked him to look up Um, this year. Now, this is from 2017, but uh, last year, I should say, 259 players on opening day rosters were born outside of the U.S., marking a new high for the league since it began tracking this data in 1995. Those athletes make up 29.8% of the league's total 868 players. And the previous record highest number of foreign-born players was 246 in 2007, while the record for highest percentage of foreign-born players was 29.2% in 2005. The Texas Rangers boast the most players from countries outside the U.S., with 14 players from six different countries. The San Diego Padres, Seattle Mariners, Chicago White Sox, Cleveland Indians, and Los Angeles Angels. I guess they're coming in second. I can't open the rest of the comment, but um, oh, Los Angeles! I I knew it. There was more. Los Angeles Angels and the Philadelphia Phillies all have more than ten players from other countries. In total, nineteen countries and territories are represented in major leagues, including the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Cuba. 93 players, 77 players, and 23 respectively. There are 23 Cubans on Major League rosters. That's a surprising stat. I would, I don't even know if I would even come close. I might have said like 10. 23 Cubans on Major League rosters. I, I would have said lower surprise. than that number, too. That's a surprise. Um, you look at uh, Curacao. That's another. Um, if Got a lot of stars from Curacao uh, playing in the game right now. A lot of infield stars. Um, so that's another one that's probably represented pretty well. Um, international flavor, baby. That's the way Major League Baseball is headed, and I love it. I love it. So just to kind of sew up that point, um, international expansion, probably not out of the question. Yeah, like, like I said at the beginning of the show, it, it's just all about the facilities and the in the ballparks and the infrastructure around uh, a new ballpark is, is, in my opinion, the only hurdle. Uh, aside from anything, you know, with – Cuba, any kind of political uh, roadblocks there, which there are plenty of them right now. Um, hopefully in the future there won't be, so we'll see. Well, getting the, getting the fans to the stadium is kind of the important thing uh, all across all across Major League Baseball, and you uh, you saw an interesting thing this week with the Oakland Athletics. What, what did they do? Yeah, I, I, 
I forget what the exact circumstances were, but they uh, they had a game where they just let all the fans in for free, a free game. Come bring your families, come hang out, no uh, no cost for tickets. And I thought that was really cool of them to do. Uh, I wish more teams would do you know one year one one game a year even um, free ticket day. You know that that's. That's awesome, and that that builds excitement and brings in maybe people that wouldn't normally come to a game, and especially when you talk about young fans. And we've had this discussion before. Going to a major league baseball game when you're a kid, it really draws you in, and it can hook you. You know, you can get fans by making impressions on on kids and and young people coming to games. Um, and a free ticket game is a really cool way to do that. So yeah, I mean. You you look at the financial numbers of it. Okay, you don't you don't get those ticket sales for that one game, but you know what? You might bring in some lifelong fans who are going to be coming back and buying tickets for years and years. Uh, so it's it's kind of a cool way to invest in your fan base and try to you know engage with your uh, with your fans and bring them in for free. Go buy some hot dogs. We'll still make some money. <laughs> they're, mug- they're making money regardless. I mean, there's merchandising and TV contracts and radio deals. They're they're making money, uh, you know. So getting them through the door, it's kind of the old adage in the bar business, right? You know, you hit a 300% markup on everything in here, so just get them through the door, and right? And uh, how about those uniforms the A's are wearing this year? Those Kelly Green uniforms? Man, those are sharp. I, I they I'll did. Tell you, they did real, real well to I go back think to those. They are I like that. Absolutely a lot. fire, fire. Those uniforms are awesome. Um, the Phillies throwing it back, wearing the powder blues. Yeah, uh, yeah. The powder blues. Uh, Jake Arrieta was on the mound that day. Had a real nice start. Kind of sharp. I'm not gonna lie. I liked kinda, it too. Kind of sharp. <laughs> um, the Yankee. It's so tough, man, being a Yankees fan because you see all these these promotions. All summer long, the White Sox will wear, you know, the old baggy wool wool style uniforms. As we know, the White Sox like to throw back uniforms, and, you know, they like to employ people that take scissors to those yes, said uniforms. Um, so we know the White Sox are all in for nostalgic uniforms, but uh, I like that. And the Yankees don't do it. Um, couple, they, they a couple of years the ago, Yankees shouldn't do a that. couple of years ago, they they indulged. It, I I think they were playing Boston, or maybe Detroit or something. They indulged though, and they they dressed up and they were they were definitely away because they wore the gray and they had the big NY on it. But there was guys, you know, with the Alfonso Soriano look, you know, with the the pants rolled all the way up. With no, come on, they didn't do that back then, guys. <laughs> you know, you look you look very modern, and it's it's not the point. You're supposed to throw it back i don't know i like throwback days i do turn back the clock right yeah i, 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 I don't know i I'm a, I'm a pinstripe guy i like when those old school pinstripe wool uniforms I like the gas house gang dizzy and daffy dean like that's that's the style of baseball i like to watch maybe but <laughs> nobody pitches like that anymore with the whole full wind up above their head no the boy that's, that's boyd that's gone probably forever <laughs> Um, quick little injury rundown from some notes uh, from the last week, couple weeks. Uh, Byron Buxton is out currently with a foot injury. Um, aggravated that in uh, a minor league uh, rehab game. Uh, Mark Melanson has been transferred to the 60-day disabled list with shoulder issues. So um, if you were wise to pick up Hunter Strickland in your fantasy baseball league, you're I getting was. paid. <laughs> Dividends for that shrewd move, because Mark Melanson, sixty day DL, it's not yeah, looking good. It doesn't look like he's coming back anytime soon. Um, Shohei Otani with an ankle injury uh, left the game the other day. Uh, it looks like he is going to miss his next start. Now they initially said doesn't look too bad. Uh, he should be able to start his next start here. Uh, why push? Him? I think Tuesday or Wednesday. And, and I agree. Yeah, why push him? You know, especially when you're already playing him. In the field, and how many innings did he pitch last year? Not, uh, I don't think he pit, I don't think he threw a hundred. Not 100. too many. He got hurt last year too. Yeah, I don't think he threw a hundred innings last year. You know, so it if looks it were like, any um, prospect that you've had in your system coveted all the way up through your minor league system as one of your gems, 
you're gonna have an innings limit on them anyway. Mm-hmm. You're gonna and it's gonna be what double the double the previous year or or twenty five percent above the previous year. They don't they don't go crazy with these innings. So I mean, treat them like that. Yeah, As a young kid, treat them like that. I'm I'm completely fine. I, I think it's understandable to say, you know, you hold them out, you you push it back a few days. Um, so. I don't know when he's going to be making his next start, but it's not going to be his next scheduled one, which was supposed to be mid to early part of this week. What happened to Showy Sundays, man? I know. I was wondering if we were going to have one today. A couple. It made weeks the most amount. We talked about it. it. It made the most amount of sense for him. He, if he wasn't going to bat the day after his start, how many Monday games is he really going to miss? The the postponed games kind of threw a wrench into that too. Yeah, that well, whole plan. Postponed games threw a wrench into everything. Into everybody's plans, um, except. Didi Gregorius. Except Didi, yeah. That's and it. Ozzie Albies right now. Yoana yeah. um, Cespedes injured his thumb in today's game. Uh, I don't know how serious that one is, but they pulled him from the game, and uh, it, it sounds like there is some concern there. No golf tomorrow. Uh, Josh Donaldson is preparing for a minor league rehab a stint here. He'll be probably playing two or three games in the minors, and then uh, the Blue Jays are <laughs> looking I to hope bring they rehab him back. that arm up. Oh my I guess God. he was throwing today, and they said he looked like he was he was back. He's can ready. Ju- to can Justin Smoke play third base? Yeah, no kidding. Sw- swap <laughs> him swap and Donaldson. Him, swap him out. Yeah, if Justin Smoke can make the throw better <laughs> than Josh Donaldson. Russ Martin's played third base before. Throw him out there. Donnie Mattingly played third base, too, so, I mean – uh, let's see. Uh, Yasiel Puig is banged up right now, too. He's on the disabled list with a hip injury. Um, speaking of third base, and we mentioned the Blue Jays there, um, Jose Bautista signed a contract with the Atlanta Braves, and it sounds like he's primarily going to be playing third base once he's ready to come up. He's in the I'll minors right now. He's struggling really really bad in the minors right now so they haven't made the move to bring him up to the major league club and i i thought that signing was kind of weird i didn't i didn't get it because first of all he's not a good he's not an above average fielder in the outfield and he has played third base but it has been many many years since he's been a regular third base but he played a little bit of third last year with with toronto but he's not an asset defensively to put it lightly to put it very nicely. And if any team was going to take a shot on him, I figured it'd be an American League team and throw him on the bench, throw him at DH here and there if he gets hot, you know, he's your DH for a bit. Um but that was that was an odd signing to me. So we'll see where that goes, but it's an odd signing for a lot more reasons than that. A young group of talent seemingly no expectation to win. It's just an odd right. fit for a young team. Just like a Atlanta. crazy fit because he's, by all accounts, a terrible clubhouse guy. Mm-hmm. So, I I don't know. You know, if the Braves were in a win now mode, which maybe they are, maybe this hot start got them got them feeling a little cocky. You know, and it's not a bad thing. Maybe they're in that win now mode, but you gotta think that the Atlanta Braves are not in the win now mode right now, and that's that's a win now. Maybe we catch lightning in a bottle here with Jose Batista type move. Otherwise, it, there's no justification for it. There's not. You know, you know, like we say, by all accounts, he's he's a bad clubhouse guy. Why do you want to bring that around those guys? Very teach, odd. Teach him there. the right. Teach him the right way. Right. So let's go down. Uh, let's go down through the standings for this young season here. One month uh, today. First month it flew. It flew. It flew right by. After wanting to get there so badly, flew now right it's by. flying by one month. One month. You go ahead and start off. So where, we, where are we starting off? We already kind of talked a little bit about the, the NLE, so I won't get too much into it. But, uh, yeah, the Mets are uh, they're kind of holding strong at the top of the division. They're not as on fire as they were. Five and uh, five in their last couple ten. weeks ago. Yeah, so they're the last ten they're they're at five hundred and their their overall record is seventeen and nine. Very still good. good splits on the home and home and away. Very good still. ten and five on the road to start the season. Um in your first fifteen games on the road, nothing to sneeze at. Um so the Mets staying the course so far. And uh, they're a game and a half up on both Atlanta and Philly. Um two young uh Surprising team so far, uh, 16 and 11 there. And then the Washington Nationals struggling, 12 and 16. They're only 3 and 7 in their last 10. Uh, so we, we mentioned it. 
so I won't really get into it too much, but pressure is mounting there. Uh, and no surprise, uh, bringing up the rear, the Miami Marlins at 9-18. and 18. I'll tell you what, there is a surprise there. That, they're, that they have nine wins already? Absolutely. They're do- I, yeah, they're doing better than we thought they would. They uh, have nine wins. That's not bad. <laughs> that's not bad. Um, NL Central, we'll move over there. The surprising 17-11 Pittsburgh Pirates still atop that division, but haven't been playing as good as they're of late. They're of actually late. on a five-game win streak right now. They we, went they went through a little uh, lull. Went through a lull. Well, they did. Um, you know, we It's been two weeks since we've done a show, since we've done a show. And, and last week, they had a pretty rough week. Uh, this week, uh, back to it because it, it looks like they actually lost five in a row prior to that. So they lost five in a row. Now they've won five in a row. Showdown with the Nationals coming up uh, here, first games of this week, uh, starting tomorrow. Three games set with the Nationals. Um, maybe they can sustain it. Every show that we get deep, we get deeper and deeper and deeper, and we keep asking ourselves if the Pirates can hang around and. Pirates are still hanging around. So far, so good. The Chicago Cubs following up uh, with 15-10, and 10, um, 8 and 2 in their last 10, so turning things around in Chicago or uh, maybe just getting a little steady, getting their uh, getting their pace about them. Uh, the 15-12 and 12, uh, Arizona Cardinals. Listen to me. I got, the, I got the draft on the brain right now. <laughs> <laughs> the 15-12 and 12 St. Louis Cardinals uh, followed up by the 16-13 and 13 Milwaukee Brewers. So if you don't think – that the postponements going on in Major League Baseball have affected anything. Just look at the standings. Uh, you got the Brewers with more wins than the Cubs and the Cardinals, yet they're behind them in the standings, sitting in fourth. Uh, and the worst team in the majors right now, uh, Cincinnati Reds, 7-21. and 21. Uh, Good enough for a 250 winning percentage. They are 4-12 and 12 on the road and 3-9 and nine at home and 4-6 and six in their last 10 and are now underneath the umbrage of I, I guess he's the interim manager, correct? Uh, yeah, interim manager. Uh, Jim Riggleman. Riggleman, and then yeah. uh, former Yankee Pat Kelly is the, I guess, interim yeah, bench Pat coach Kelly. there. Pat Kelly. Pat Kelly getting a mention. Didn't Pat thought Kelly. about Pat hey, Kelly. If you're out there, call the baseline. would love to talk to you about Cincinnati Reds. Pat <laughs> Kelly. Pat <laughs> Kelly, man. Br- tell Mike Paliruda a call, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Pags is, where he, what's he, a uh, hitting coach in <laughs> Miami right now? He's a hitting coach somewhere. I don't know if it's Miami or Tampa or, or where he's at, but he's he's coaching somewhere too right now. Um, the Cincinnati Reds fired their manager in this past week, um, setting a new major league record. 20 games into the season. Wow. We'll be getting to that a little bit more later on. That's just Towards atrocious. the end of our show. We need to go back and erase – our preview show uh, when <laughs> when I was so adamant on how could that lineup in Cincinnati flop. Uh, Joey Votto got on the board uh, since our last show with his first homer of the season. <laughs> the pitching has been it's just so, so awful there that even if uh, Votto was hitting and, and, you know, Suarez wasn't hurt, who he's back he's now, back I believe. Now. But, uh, you know, even if they didn't have any Votto, I, some of their hitters – their pitching has been so bad that I don't think that would make much of a difference. You know, we mentioned our, in our last show <laughs> about Nick Senzel. You know, he hasn't made his debut yet. He hasn't come up. Uh, I think he much, got uh, banged up in the minor leagues over Much to a lot of people's surprises. But you know what? I don't blame him. Why do you want to bring a kid into, into this situation right now um, where really it's just a drain already? I, I don't know if you saw last week, but – I saw some uh, updated percentages, um, you know, chance to win the World Series. <laughs> and the Cincinnati Reds were at 0.0%. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's just... Yeah, it doesn't get know, any worse than that. No, it's just a tough pill to swallow probably coming into the season for a lot of their veteran guys. So, um, I don't know. But that's where we, I guess, thought we were going to see, <laughs> except me. I, I I didn't think I was going to see him at 7-21 and 21 at this point in the season. Uh, but there you go. Bringing up the caboose in the central is the Cincinnati Reds at 7-21. And And out west, we got the Diamondbacks off to their hot start continuing. Diamondbacks are looking really good right now. 19-8. Five games up on Colorado. Um, That's 
it's a pretty good sized lead for one month into the season. Uh, their their lineup is looking great. Uh, the pitching has been pretty good. Uh, they did lose Taiwan Walker for the season, one of their starting pitchers, but uh, you know for the most part things have been pretty good in in Arizona so far this season. Um, second place, the Colorado Rockies, uh, sitting at one game above 500 at 15 and 14. Um, they've been they only lost a couple in a row now. Uh, they've been just kind of trudging along at 500 for for a little while now. Um, the San Francisco Giants are now at 500 at 14 and 14, and if they could kind of hover around that 500 mark and Madison Bumgarner comes back in, I don't know, maybe, say, a month, then uh, maybe you'll see them make a little climb up the standings. Cueto's been pitching pretty good. Samarja's back now. Uh, hasn't been pitching great, but he hasn't been bad, and he's he's just kind of shaking off the rust and just getting his season underway. So be interesting to see if they can kind of hang in there until uh, Mad Bum is ready to, to come back. Uh, the Dodgers... They've lost two in a row now, but they started so terribly that uh, they're now up to twelve and fifteen. So they're they're making their way up the standings a yeah, little but bit. That's deceiving too. Um, you know they they're just lost back to back series. Um, just lost three out of four to the rival Giants. Um, you know they pounded them in the game they won. I think they scored fifteen or sixteen mm-hmm. runs in the game that they won. But you lose three out of four to the Giants. And then you lose two out of three prior to that to the Marlins. Um, That's rough. You know, so their 12 and 15 start, definitely not what you thought out of the Nationals or the Dodgers to be both sitting here at 12 and 15 at the end of April. But um, I don't know. Are the Dodgers really turning it around when they, they lose three out of four to the Giants and, and then two out of three to the Marlins? Um, I think they split with the Nets uh, before that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say they're turning it around, but they they have bounced back a little bit from. I think they swept the Padres from a horrendous start beginning of last week. At some point, I think they had four wins against the Padres, and maybe that bolstered uh, their win total. But I don't know. I, I think there's got to the, be um, caution in in LA right now. Interesting too. note on the Dodgers today is um, Dave Roberts pulled Cody Bellinger for the game from the game for uh, lack of hustling today. Interesting. So one of the top young bats in baseball, and you know you're off to a not a good start. And Bellinger has actually been pretty good. Yeah, I think he had a a double in the game before they pulled him. And Roberts, once he came back to the dugout after after an inning where he was dogging it, said, "You're you're out. You're, if you're not going to hustle, you're off the field." Somebody's got to be made an example of. Mm-hmm. Somebody's got to wear the crown. So maybe Bellinger's just wearing it, um, and Dave had to pick a way to pick somebody out of the crowd and say, yep, you're the guy, and you're going to be the one that I absolutely crucify right now mm-hmm. um, to make an example and maybe inspire some of these guys. But you, would, you wouldn't think that the team with one of the highest payrolls in Major League Baseball, um, a clear-cut favorite to make the World Series, um, you know, defending National League champion would be scuffling the way that they are, but they are. Uh, Kershaw hasn't looked like Kershaw. Uh, a couple times this year, um, very un Kershaw like starts. So maybe the panic button needs to start, and maybe that's Robert's way of hitting the panic button, pulling Cody Bellinger. Almost yeah, like it, almost like when a when calls aren't going your way for so long, and you say, you know what, I'm gonna go get tossed. I'm gonna have this ump run me, and my team's gonna get inspired seeing me fight for them, right? Maybe this is almost the same thing. I'm going to make an example out of this kid, so I, maybe everybody shuts up and listens, and we can turn this thing oh, around. That, yeah, that's definitely a part of it. But even beyond that, too, with this guy being one of your best young players and a superstar. I mean, he hit, I don't know what his final number was last year. 40-something. Right? Yeah, like maybe just shy of 40, maybe 38, 39 home runs. You don't want that to be become ingrained in him. You, you have to stop that now when he's a young guy. Um, or else it's just going to become a habit of his. And if you don't, as a manager, step up and be a leader in that situation, then he's going to keep doing it. And then other people are going to see him doing it, and they're going to start doing it. And you don't want your young players, your Corey Seegers, or um, you know, your Jock Petersons, or you know, you name it, seeing this. And and that's why Yasiel Puig has kind of been a little bit of a, a controversial character there over the last couple of years because he's. 
know, there has been times where he might not be running out a, a, a ground ball or not hustling the way he should. And you saw it even with Robinson, Robinson Cano, Cano in his early years with the Yankees. And, and Cano, you know, it seemed like nipping that in the butt early kind of helped because I didn't see it as much as you know as he matured as a player. Robinson Cano played the game at a different speed. He plays the game at a different speed. And he almost it's so effortless that it almost looks like he's dogging it a lot of times. Uh but with the with the guaranteed ground ball, you're you're out, that type stuff, it doesn't fly with me because I always watch a guy like Jeter bust it down the line. A guy like Cal Ripken bust it down the line mm-hmm. because the throw could go into the crowd at any given time the ball could slip. Anything. The, first baseman could drop it and had you been busting it down the line you'd be safe but you gave him ample time to pick the ball up and you know so good I'm, it's a good thing to see they got seven games on the road coming up straight um you know they go to uh to arizona right now league leaders um they're gonna go and go to play arizona at arizona and then three at the padres and then back home against arizona so Where's the respite for this team? Uh, seven games on the road and then back home to play the division leaders again. Um, they got to turn it around soon. Uh, they do have three games coming up against the Reds. So uh, there's the know, opportunity. There is right hope. There. In, they, they blew it against the Marlins. They better they better sweep. The well, Reds. they got the Marlins, <laughs> the Marlins and Reds in back to back series um, in the middle of May, in the heart of May. So. Maybe that's there, where maybe that's where the ship writes itself in the seven the, games against the Reds and Marlins. There's the medicine right there. The opportunity is waiting for him. Uh, but you know maybe it's panic time um, right now, and Dave Roberts might be showing that by the way that he uh, he handled Cody Bellinger. So the um, right now the playoff, and of course you know we're a month into the season, but just to kind of give you an idea of the uh, playoff picture in the National League is the. The New York Mets, Pittsburgh Pirates, and Arizona Diamondbacks are your division leaders and your three, let's see, your two wild cards. You got the Chicago Cubs and then uh, Atlanta and Philadelphia tied for that second spot. Nobody had that. And then uh, just outside of the playoffs, you have the St. Louis Cardinals, Milwaukee Brewers, uh, Colorado Rockies, San Francisco, L.A. Dodgers, and Washington right there. So a lot of big name teams on the outside looking in right there um that you know especially your your Washingtons and your Dodgers like we said it's not panic time yet but the pressure is on and you know a couple weeks go by 3 4 weeks go by here and you're still you're still floundering there and you got these upstart young teams ahead of you then then it's it's panic time and the seat is going to start getting hot for the managers there so over to the American League, we've got uh, the Boston Red Sox in first place at 20-7. and seven. Um, They struggled a little bit this last week or so. Uh, Tampa Bay, uh, Z and I were talking a little bit about it before we went on the air. It just seems like Tampa Bay is one of those teams that just has Boston's number. Uh, no matter where they are in the standings, it seems like Tampa can always kind of be that uh, annoying thorn in their side and, and beat them a few games. And they they beat them a few games, and the Yankees right behind them there uh, on an eight-game win streak. And, and currently, uh, I believe they're winning right now uh, Sunday Night Baseball. Two to one. So potentially here. Uh, Two to one, bottom of the sixth. If the they Yankees pull winning. tonight's game off, they're looking at a nine-game win streak, whereas they would be behind Boston by two games. Uh, Toronto, 15-12. and 12, They're five games back. Tampa Bay is twelve and fourteen, but they have gone eight and two in their last ten. If I told you at this point in the season that the Dodgers, the Nationals, and the Rays were going to have the same record, you would have laughed at me. I would have. I definitely would have. So Tampa Bay at twelve and fourteen. It might not sound good on paper, but they've been hot lately, and uh, for what expectations were, uh, that's. That's a positive, positive record, and they got some young talent there. Blake, Smel- Blake Snell is pitching pretty good. Um, got a win against Boston this past weekend. A um, couple other good young players there in the minors, and uh, that's a team that's not going to rush it, though. No, uh, they're not, and and I ex- ex- fully expect them to be toward the top of that. They got to get the hall bot- f- bottom of that division all season long. Got to get the hall for Archer. Yep, got to make sure that happens. He's got to stop self imploding for them to get a, a max. Max type hall. We've talked about that. Um, and that's on the horizon for the Rays. 
You know, it's they already know based on what happened in their off season. You know, Rays fans, they definitely know what's coming. But the Orioles at eight and twenty. Orioles at eight and twenty. Right. We didn't now. see give up mode happening this soon. Twelve, 12 and a half games it's, back. It's time already. It's time to bust it out. Time to bust this. This there's a fire coming. A fire sale coming to Baltimore. Pick your pieces. Manny Machado. I don't think anybody's safe, to tell you the honest truth. Why wouldn't you go back or go and get as big a haul as you can get for Manny Machado? You kind of have to at this point. Well, Twelve and a half games back after one month. It's not going to get any better. Somebody's a free agent him. after the season. He's leaving regardless, no matter what. you got to. Somebody see, very will give similar you with Chris Archer, but he's a free agent as well, so it, the. You, you know, you've got a couple months to to kind of make that franchise changing the, trade the and difference, get a haul for him. The difference between the Archer, obviously, Machado is going to command much more, okay, and that's a stark difference. But the the main difference between the Archer and Machado thing is you're talking about any team that goes out and trades for Archer has a legitimate shot of being able to sign him. The next season. There's four teams that can sign Machado. Maybe five. So there's a big difference at who's going to go and be willing to give up a prospect or two or three. You know, a really big haul for a rental on Machado when there's no way that they're going to be able to sign him after the deal. No way. Um, You know, so you got to look at things like that with the Machado deal at really where the market's going to play for him might be it might be limited to somebody that's going to be able to sign him mm-hmm. you know um that or you could see like um you know say like when CC Sabathia CC Sabathia was traded yeah. to the Brewers mm-hmm. or there's a there's a couple other examples um can't really think of any other good ones off the top of my head but yeah you might see one of those true rental trades where it's pretty much obvious that, hey, we're getting you for the next two months and hopefully a World Series run, and then you know you can go on your way and sign your multi-million long-term uh, deal with whoever you want at that point. But Baltimore is going to have to move him regardless, and it should be interesting to kind of follow along there. And we'll talk about Manny Machado a little bit towards the end of our show here. Um, into the central, the Cleveland Indians in first place at 14 and 12. Uh, they've lost a couple in a row. They're five and five in their last 10. Um, the bats are starting to come alive a little bit there. Michael Brantley is, is killing it right now. He's, I don't have his numbers in front of me, but he's batting 350, 360 right now. Uh, of course, a major injury risk at any time he could go down. But while he's healthy, which he seemingly is at this point, uh, and in the lineup most days, that that's a major, major asset to have in the middle of your lineup. So Cleveland's heating up, at least with the bats right now. The record's um, kind of stagnant a little bit. They're kind of hovering there uh, just above 500, but it won't be long before they uh, they just go on another crazy run and and the way the rest of that division is right now speaking of above 500 you're looking at it that's it the indians that's it the rest of the games above 500 and that is the rest of the division it's not even close at best four games under 500 and that would be the detroit tigers at four games under 500 11 15 the twins the white Sox, and the royals and how disappointing are the minnesota twins right now they're one in nine in their last ten uh, nine and fourteen. Just so had Miguel Sano go down. They they had a good start. They started out what eight and five, I guess, and one and nine in their last ten. So, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a a mess there right now. And that Lance Lynn is getting crushed. That's a ship that can fill with water pretty quickly. Lance Lynn's getting crushed. You said Sano's down with an injury. Yeah, um, an hamstring injury. Buxton's out right now. Uh, their starting shortstop is suspended for uh, probably another 50 games or so. Um, so they, they better out turn it around quick. Line. Yeah, Jorge Polanco. He was out of the base. He still is out of the baseline still out of for the another baseline. 50 games. <laughs> yeah, another 50 games left of being out of the baseline. That ought to teach you. So, yeah, Minnesota is a major uh, disappointment. The one, Royals one and the White Sox is expected. 
Minnesota went and Completely added expected. pieces to try to duplicate what they did last year. And they were a playoff just, team last it's year. A, it's abysmal right now. Uh, out to the West, obviously, we got the Astros in first place. Who would have thunk it? At 19 and 10, 7 and 3 in their last 10, so really starting to heat up out there. Um, Seattle and uh, Los Angeles Angels. Tied Seattle's heating up as well. 16 and 11. Um, and well, they're going in opposite directions. Uh, Seattle seven and three in their last ten, and the Angels three and seven in their last ten. The so. Angels' problem was uh, they ran into the Yankees, Red Sox buzzsaw this past week. They played, they had series against both of those teams and did not fare well. The Athletics at uh, an even five hundred, fourteen and fourteen, and the Rangers bringing up the rear in the West at eleven and eighteen. So we're going to run through uh, real quickly the some of the league leaders here. Uh, but before we do, I want to let you guys all know about our website, disruptionnetwork.net. Please check that out. Uh, you can check out uh, former, you know, past episodes of our show uh, and all the other great content at uh, disruptionnetwork.net. The D! Uh, the D. There's a whole bunch of great shows. Um, there, there's something for everybody, too, which is the cool thing about Disruption Network. You know, we're here to talk baseball, uh, but you got EC Radio covering everything everything um monday it's a through smorgasbord thursday. of fun three o'clock every every monday through thursday so check that out uh the d-line uh they've been doing a good job covering the nfl leading up to the nfl draft here uh home free with adeline van dyke thinking about buying a house thinking about anything to do with your house tune in watch uh watch adeline van dyke on home free and what what a great resource that is to be able to you know, just tune in, even if you only have a couple minutes, even if you don't listen to the whole show. If you're looking to get some expert advice, the guests she brings on that show, I mean, Adel Adeline knows knows her stuff, and the guests that she brings on cover, like, all aspects of um, buying a home, selling a home. Um, you know, they give you the inside scoop of all that, and, and they actually, you know, I went through the whole process of, of purchasing a home last year and selling my home. And I had a ton of questions, and it's it's funny. And I I did find those question answers to most of those questions because I worked with some good people. Uh, but listening to her show, it's like, yeah, I wish uh, you know I I, I w wish I was watching this last year because all the questions I had, pretty much completely covered. Um, so that's a, a really good uh, another one of the great shows here at Disruption Network. Uh, Back talk with Tommy Drama. He gets everybody all fired up. And, yeah, if you're uh, looking to get fired up. I lo love to hear him get going. Uh, so I put it on at work. I, I listen I listen to Tommy. Um, if, yeah, if you're looking to get fired up, listen to Tommy drama. Or um, or at least if you're li uh, looking to listen to somebody get fired up. Because agreed. Tommy gets fired up, and he speaks his mind, and, and it's it's great. You know, it's, it's his right to do so. It's his and right he exercises so. his right. And, and he's got a great forum to do it, and... Yeah, again, check out all these uh, Ease Beats and Biz. All these shows. Eats Beats and Biz is another one. Our hip hop podcast. Uh, also, we got a new wrestling podcast uh, to be on the lookout for uh, on the D. So yeah, Disruption Network, something for everyone. DisruptionNetwork dot net. Check us out. Watch our old episodes, and uh, thank you for the support. So let's go through some league leaders now. Um, we got a little bit more of a sample size to work with last last time around it was still kind of interesting to see some of the numbers but being a month into the season yeah it's still a small sample size you're, you're looking at i don't know what what about one sixth of the season uh in the books but the numbers are starting to look a little bit uh more human more human here uh in some cases in some cases in, in some cases they're like avenger superhuman <laughs> numbers and I yes like they those, are i like those kind of numbers See, you got and the league leaders. I up. do. You gotta in, pull them up. In the American League, uh, batting average, we got Manny Machado, who we will be talking about in a little while. Manny Machado, Machado. Listen, I'm <laughs> renaming him already. Uh, Manny Machado hitting 361 on the abysmal Baltimore Orioles. Didi Gregorius with the Yankees off to a tremendous start, hitting 356. Jose Altuve 351. Mookie Betts 344. And Malik Smith. 
another one of those young talented players uh down in Tampa Bay. Yeah, he's uh, got uh 342. He's got a little bit more playing time now with um Well, he's qualified if he's on this list. So. Kevin Kiermeyer uh went down with a, a long-term injury. It looks like he's going to be out for 2 to 3 months. Um I don't know, Kevin Kiermeyer might be happier sitting in the clubhouse right now than uh, although they have been doing well like we said. But yeah, Malik Smith uh elite speed uh base runner there. Surprising to see him up on the leaderboard though. He's kind of uh historically a, you know, at best 250 guy, but he's getting the playing time and and he's uh he's he's putting up the numbers. Your AL home run leaders, you're led uh, by a traditional guy up at the top of the list uh of the Los Angeles Angels, maybe the best player in the game, Mike Trout with 10. Uh Didi Gregorius. Didi. Didi, Sir Didi. 10 home runs in April. I can't believe what Ten Didi's home runs doing. in April. Um, Mitch Hanniger, another surprise to be up there with uh, with ten home runs. Uh, the aforementioned Manny Machado with nine, and Matt Davidson of the Chicago White Sox has nine home runs and uh, might be on pace to set the strikeout record this year. He might be really close. Uh, he's on a he's on a judgy in pace, um, and I'm only alluding to the fact of judges strikeouts because it annoys me so much, as you know. Um, strikeouts are really a non-issue when you get on base and score more runs and produce more runs than anybody else in the game. I don't care how you make your outs. It's working for I him. don't care how you make your outs. If you get on base four and a half times out of ten, I don't care how you make your outs. You're gonna Everybody makes outs. In, so, in, in some ways, the strikeout could be better. If you got a guy in first base, it's better to there's strike out. There's more to a strikeout than a number. You know, if you got right? nobody out or one out and there's a guy on first base and you strike you out, strike out it's a, a play, heck of right? a lot better than grounding into a double play. But still, you know, my power hitter, and not to go off on a tangent here because we're going to get back into league leaders, but my power hitter, middle of the order guy, is that the guy that I want changing his approach with two strikes and rolling over softly to the shortstop? No, that's not what I want. So there's more to the strikeout than just the fact that a guy struck out. How's his chase percentage? How's his eye? And clearly he leads the league in walks, and he leads the league in getting on base, so his eye, he's got a great eye. So if he's swinging through strikes, trying to put the ball, do something with the ball power-wise, I have no problem with that if he's swinging through, even if he's looking. If he gets caught looking or guessing and you know somebody rings him up on a 12-6 to curveball that he wasn't sitting on, he was sitting dead red, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with guys striking out. I got a problem with guys chasing ridiculous pitches and striking out. That's a problem. So look at Aaron Judge more so, you know, when he strikes out. His strikeout numbers are ridiculously low as compared to his his career pace. Um, But even any kind of guy that is a high on-base guy and a high-producing guy, if his outs, Mike Trout led the league in his, his rookie of the year, um, or MVP. He was MVP and led the league in strikeouts. So... It, it can happen. Uh, strikeouts aren't that big of a deal. So that that's how we're going to discuss our AL home run leaders is also <laughs> talking about strikeouts. Is Joe Gallo somewhere on that list? Because he should be. Um, AL runs betted in. Here's the surprise, uh, probably maybe on the whole AL league leaderboard. Uh, AL runs betted in Didi Gregorius. Didi with 30. With 30 in April. And he's not the only surprise. A on record for a shortstop, by the way. Um, the previous record was 24, I believe. Um, a record for uh, the month of April for a shortstop in Major League Baseball. Granted, you know, the season is – it starts a little earlier now, well, a a lot earlier, like a full week earlier. Um, So there's a larger time for him to get those. But still, 30 RBIs, 10 homers and 30 RBIs used to be a season for a Major League shortstop. Used to be a whole entire season. How far we've come with with shortstops. That's what we call a segue because if you stick around in a little while – we're going to discuss our top seven shortstops in Major League Baseball in our seventh inning stretch. Uh, AL wins leader, we go over to Corey Kluber in Cleveland with four. Tied up with Sean Manaya, fresh off a, uh, almost said perfect game, but fresh off a no-hitter uh, against the Boston Red Sox uh, with four. Tied with Kluber. Also Rick Porcello with four, Justin Verlander with four, and Carlos Carrasco of the Cleveland Indians. One more quick note four. on the uh, the RBI leaders. and uh, oh, it, I didn't even finish that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Jed Lowry, it's second with 27. Mitch Hanniger. Another surprise. Uh, tied for second Another with 27. Another surprise. Chris Davis in Oakland, 23. Not a surprise. Uh, J.D. Martinez, 22. Not a Not surprise. Not a surprise. But one, and I don't know where he is on the standings. I'm only looking, or in the, uh, the rankings here, uh, I'm only looking at the top five for each. 
But what does that tell you about how bad, not to get back to, you know, He's in the Baltimore Orioles right now, but what does that tell you about how bad the Baltimore Orioles have been this year? When you got Manny Machado leading the majors with a 361 average, and he's got nine home runs, and he's not even among the top five leaders in RBI. Nobody on base for the guy. Nobody's getting on base there. It's terrible. You feel you got to feel bad for him at some point in time. They got to wave the white flag. I don't feel too get, bad for get, well, him because he's about to get he's paid. He's about to get paid. <laughs> there is no doubt. Um, your AL ERA leader, uh, without surprise probably to a lot of guys, is uh, Sean Manaya uh, at 1.03. Um, he's been on every leaderboard since we started. He was up at the top when I said that we don't have a large enough sample size, so we're going to skip over ERA. And even he was since at the top. Then, since, then, then, since then, he has no hit the Boston Red Sox in the in. And then just fresh off that, I believe he had a he had uh, three or four hits and one earned yesterday. Z, you own him. <laughs> uh, Justin Verlander at one point three six, followed up by another Houston guy at one point seven three. That's Garrett Cole, newly acquired from the Pittsburgh Pirates. Reynaldo Lopez of the Chicago White Sox at one point seven eight, and Charlie Morton, another Houston guy at one point eight six. So it's not uh, really hard to tell why the Houston Astros are off, off to such a good start with 19 wins. Um, Edwin Diaz off to a ridiculous start in the AL and saves with 11. Uh, Craig Kimbrell following him up with seven. Keone Kila with six. Osuna and Kenyon Middleton, who blew one yesterday, um, are both tied with six as well. Uh, and AL war leaders. That is a really interesting stat to look at, the AL war leaders. Didi Gregorius, ahead of Mike Trout, has played to a two and a half wins above replacement this early in the season. 2.4 to be exact. And Mike Trout, 2.3. And then follow Matt Chapman, Aaron Judge, and Jed Lowry. And Aaron Judge, quietly, because of Didi's hot start, Aaron Judge is kind of flying underneath the radar, but still hitting 350. Uh, OPS up near 1,000. And who would have thought that when the season starts, especially opening day, you know, Stanton home runs, uh, two homers, uh, Judge, you know, the, the hype of those two guys in the middle of the lineup. Who would have thought here we would be a month into the season and D.D. Gregorius is the talk of the New York Yankees when you got those guys in the lineup? And it's unbelievable what, what he's doing, and it's it's awesome to watch. In 90 at bats, Didi has 32 hits, good for 356. His on base percentage is 451. OPS is 1251, so he's slugging 800. Um, 10 homers, 30 RBIs, two stolen bases, and 24 runs scored. Ridiculous. That's a ridiculous, that's a career in April. Um, <laughs> it is. And good for Didi Krikorius, Uh really. Over to the National League, your National League average leaders. Tommy Pham, outfielder for the St. Louis Cardinals, in at 341. As Drupal Cabrera, surprising, up near the top of the NL batting average leaders for the New York Mets at 340. Odubel Herrera with the Philadelphia Phillies at 337. Reese Hoskins with the Phillies at 318. And Brandon Belt off to a pretty good start, uh, a typical Brandon Belt start. Um, you know, we can revisit Brandon Belt's start in July and, and August and – he typically becomes a different player, unfortunately. Um, but usually in April and May, Brandon Belt looks like a first-round pick um, and doing so so far this year. Charlie Blackman leads the NL in home runs with nine, tied with Ozzy Albies, off to a great start in Atlanta. Bryce Harper with eight. Christian Villanueva with San Diego is eight. And Javi Baez, seven home runs for the Chicago Cubs. Speaking of Javi Baez, he's atop the NL RBI League leader list with 26. Joanna Cespedes with the New York Mets with 25. AJ Pollock, 21. Michael Franco, Michael, Mikael Franco from the Philadelphia Phillies with 20. And Ozzy Albies with 20. Ozzy Albies is just up amongst the league leaders and everything, it seems to be. Um, having a killer year over there in the NL. Uh, Max Scherzer off to the early start. Great start with five wins. Uh, Corbin, Trevor Williams, Brandon McCarthy, and Zach Godley all tied up with four. Corbin may be having the best year out of all of those guys, though, so far, uh, even though Max Scherzer's clipping him by one win 
Corbin's been untouchable uh, at points in the season. Uh, your NL ERA leaders, Johnny Cueto at point eight four. The resurgence of Johnny Cueto out there in San Francisco. And you mentioned Corbin in uh, in Cueto now, and I think I don't know if it was last week or it might have been midweek, uh, the week prior. Uh, there was a, a awesome pitchers duel between Patrick Corbin and Johnny Cueto. It was uh, I, I want to say Corbin had a no hitter going into the eighth or ninth inning even, and uh, that was that was a classic pitchers duel. That was really cool to watch. So Cueto's lead lead in the NL now with uh, zero point eight four ERA. Point eight four. It's pretty good. And here's a bright spot for the Miami Marlins there. Uh, Harlan Garcia with a one zero ERA. Then you got Carlos Martinez of the St. Louis Cardinals in third with 1.43, and Max Scherzer with 1.62. Um, Jake DeGrom fifth with 2.06, having a very good start to his season. NL saves. You got Wade Davis out there in Colorado with the, off to an early start. Uh, Ten saves already. Jury's Familia with nine. Um, has blown a couple opportunities, though, uh, recent in recent times, uh, but Still nine saves for Jerry's Familia, um, Z's favorite closer. Uh, Brad Boxberger out there in Arizona probably could have had more, but uh, has actually not appeared in some safe situations. Archie Bradley uh, has appeared ahead of him. Uh, Archie Bradley came on when Brad Boxberger was seemingly uh, available uh, for a four-out save last uh, last week. Uh, I believe Archie Bradley has two saves, uh, but... Brad Boxberger out there filling the role for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, Brandon Morrow with seven for the Cubs. And Hunter Strickland, uh, your vulture save for the year, Hunter Strickland, uh, with seven out there for San Francisco. Uh, NL wins above replacement. Uh, the previously mentioned Freddie Freeman of the Atlanta Braves uh, off to a good start again. 1.7 wins above replacement. Nick Markakis. Nick, there's a surprise. Right Markakis, one point seven wins above replacement so far for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, the surging offensive juggernaut Atlanta Braves, exciting to watch down there. Um, Nick Mark, Nick Markakis, <laughs> tied for first in Nick the NL Mark- with his teammate Freddie Freeman. Uh, Christian Villanueva, one point six. Javi Baez, one point five, and Travis Shaw. With Milwaukee having uh, having a good start to a season, one point four wins above replacement for Travis Shaw. Those are your league leaders, and they are brought to you by the stars of the Disruption Network that we mentioned previous. Thank you for listening. Go check it out at disruption dot disruption network dot net. So let's talk some fantasy baseball now. We we talked all those stats, and there are some major. Major surprising numbers on there, and there's some, you know, some guys that aren't so surprising. But uh, let's talk some fantasy baseball. So we're gonna get in into our three up and three down. Three up, three down. Which is brought to you tonight by Attorney Nick Pasalacqua and Associates. For legal help, quick, you better call Nick. Call N- Attorney Nick Pasalacqua and the team at Pasalacqua and Associates. Three one five five zero zero Nick. That's 315-500-NICK. Check out their website at cnytriallaw.com. Okay, so we mentioned Patrick Corbin, and he is the first I have here on my three up. Um, just off to a ridiculous start. Uh, that almost no hitter he had was was something to watch because he that there was no luck involved in that. He was just dealing. He was dominating that game. Um, currently... 4 and 0, no losses yet. Uh and that's in 6 starts. Let's see. He's got an ERA right now of 225 and a 0.75 whip. And he's striking out 12.4 batters per 9 innings. He's got 55 strikeouts in 40 innings. So he's he's somebody that either went undrafted or was drafted very late is you know, a, a a potential guy. Like, oh, let me pick up Patrick Corbin, see how he does here. And and he's kind of been in that spot a few times over the last few years where he was a promising-looking young pitcher. But 
for various reasons, he kind of ended up being a little bit of a disappointment. Having having some flashes and being very good at, in uh, small stretches, but is this the year he puts it all together? Because he he's looking like a legitimate ace this year. And what a value for anybody that picked him up in fantasy baseball drafts or off of the waiver wire uh, at the early part of the season here because he is he's doing very well. And it's nice to see. he's uh, He's got local ties here uh, to Utica, New York. Um, he's from the Syracuse area, and he Cicero Cicero North Syracuse, and he uh and he attended MVCC for a short period of time here, right in uh in Utica. So it's kind of cool. I he's been a guy that I've always tried to follow along in his career just because of the local ties, and it's it's cool to see him starting to put it all together and really getting attention uh, in baseball circles as being a potential ace arm. Uh, so Patrick Corbin is the first of my three up Blake Snell is another arm another very young pitcher uh, that is having a phenomenal start to the season Um, he went out there and I think it was his first start of the season they didn't want to go let him go too far into the game you want I want to say he pitched five six innings of shutout baseball against the Boston Red Sox Uh, and then he had his one bad start of the season against the New York Yankees who have been roughing up anybody this year. A lot of pitchers have, have had a hard time against the Yankees, obviously, with the uh, the bats that they have in that lineup. Uh, but ever since then, he has been rolling, and he's probably still unowned in some leagues. So if Blake Snell is unowned in your league, I would uh, I would definitely jump, jump at a chance to add him. You know, the Rays, we, we said what we said about them, not expected to be a very good team this year, but... He's a good enough pitcher at this pace if he keeps this up where that's not going to hurt him too much. Uh, you know, where you haven't seen it hurt Chris Archer too much in some of his good years. Um, they might not score a lot of runs behind him there. There might not be a lot of run support, but, you know, you're going to get a good ERA. You're going to get a good whip. You're going to get very good strikeout totals from Blake Snell. So he's my uh, number two on the three-up list. Now, number three... I wanted to save the best for last, and we have talked about him already a lot. But I can't help continuing to talk about Didi Gregorius and what he is is doing right now. Uh, the numbers he's putting up, you know, I mentioned being in a lineup with Giancarlo Stanton and Aaron Judge and Gary Sanchez. And to be the guy that is carrying, I mean, going above and beyond what those superstar names are doing, uh, I mean, Didi Gregorius is is leading the majors in home runs in RBIs. Uh, he's got a tw- uh, 1.251 OPS right now. Just unheard of numbers, especially coming from a shortstop. And I don't know how he's doing it, but, you know, he's he's had a good couple years, but nothing like this. Nothing like what he's doing right now. And it's, as a Yankee fan, it is it is a joy to watch him play the game. He's always got a smile on his face. Um, you he's know, my favorite player to get. He's right now. he's he's a great teammate by all accounts. You know, you see him in the dugout. He's he's the first one out there congratulating somebody or breaking somebody's chops about something. And and he uh, he's a good Twitter follow too. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, some of the DD tweets out Absolutely. there. Absolutely, he, he tweets after every he's, game. He's like the king of emojis too. He's got an emoji for like every player. They all have their own little emoji that he always throws out there when they have a good game. And it's it, it's. It's cool to see him succeeding, and yeah. succeeding right now is, you know, again, putting it lightly with, with Sir, what he is doing. Sir Merrickson Julius Gregorius O-O-N. Sir Didi. Sir Didi. And he's he's our first two-timer on the three-up list. I had him a few weeks ago, and he kind of started going on this hot streak, but I couldn't help to put but put him on there again he's the first two-timer on the three up section of uh three up three down if you're keeping track at home if you're keeping track at home he he just set another record he's the first ever player to be on the three up list twice (laughs) so on the other side of the spectrum the three down list luis castillo wow he has been awful and that's a, a guy i had high hopes for and I heard a lot of people say, you know, you see what Luis Severino did last year, and 
Castillo has the potential to have that kind of a turnaround and have that kind of a breakthrough season. And I drafted him in our fa- fantasy baseball draft, uh, but he has just been getting absolutely shelled. Um, I got to pull up his numbers here. I don't have. Well, him in he front had of uh, his last start against the Twins. One inning, one inning pitched, six hits, five runs, five earned, two walks. Um, his ERA is seven point eight five on the season. Uh, his previous start before that against the Cardinals on four twenty two was five innings pitched, seven hits, three runs, three earned. Four walks. 7.85 ERA. 7.85. A month into the season. And, you know, every every pitcher is going to have a bad day here and there. But he's had pretty much six consecutive bad starts to start the season. Um, so it, it might be time to, to cut the cord with Luis Castillo. I, I made the move and just dropped him yesterday when he was just getting shelled. I, Right during the middle of the game, I said, I'm done. I, all right, I'm cutting him. <laughs> I need the roster spot. I could use it somewhere else. Um, so Luis Castillo, definitely some major concern there. Um, I don't know if he's going to be a productive pitcher this year, and, and especially on that team. You know, the Cincinnati Reds are so bad right now that even if he does turn it around and, and do somewhat well, I mean, how many wins is is he in line for? Not Not too many. Not too many. So Luis Castillo, number one on the three down list. My next one is a another pitcher, and this one is a New York Yankee. It's got to be Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray, <laughs> with his 7.71 ERA, um, which is, let's see, just barely lower than Luis Castillo, which is not saying much. Um, Sonny Gray's ERA isn't even the most appalling number on his No, right? it's not. The Th- whip. That's just the beginning the, of it. The whip is just... He's got to be over maybe two and a half. He's or he's close. got right now two point one four whip, <laughs> meaning he lets more than two guys on base every, every inning. single inning. He walks six guys a game. He walks a lot of guys. He nibbles. He nibbles. He doesn't. He doesn't challenge anyone ever. He doesn't get ahead in counts, and when he does get ahead in counts, he nibbles. Uh, man, they're yeah. gonna try changing it up. I guess with Austin Romine catching him instead, they have uh, to try something. I, but anything that might help right now, you geez. might as well try it. You have every right to put him on your three down list. He should have been all three all three spots on the three down list. We should have talked about his last three starts. <laughs> yeah, he's he's been he's playing he's to been a bad. negative WAR this year. It, it's disappointing to see. It's it's a good thing, you know, for us Yankees fans that they have such a good offense that they actually have hope in some of these games where he goes out there and just walks everybody and gives up home runs. But he's going to have to turn it around pretty quick. I'm glad you said something, Gray. He's going to have to turn it around. Sonny, if you're out there listening to the baseline, turn it around, dude. (laughs) Be the ace that you once were. Challenge hitters. Get ahead. Rock and fire. I'm sure they said that at some point in time in your baseball career. Don't think. Just pitch. It can only hurt the ball club, man. It can only hurt the ball club. Just pitch. So who's your third down? Rounding out our three down, <laughs> Carlos Santana of the Philadelphia Phillies. Oh, um, yeah, he's off to a uh, a very bad start as well. A one sixty five batting average. That's the um, Phillies get, man. That's the Phillies get this this off season, and he's not he's not performing. Even more concerning is his is probably his two ninety seven slugging percentage. So it's not like he's even you know when he does get a hit, it's a home run or or, or double. It's he, he's he's just not hitting for any kind of extra base power. He's got two home runs right now. Um off to a very very slow start there. He he is a guy that traditionally starts slow too. I wouldn't be too concerned about him yet, but um he's he's known to be a slow starter and we'll see if he can turn it turn it around a little bit, maybe get on the three up list uh in a, a couple weeks here. So that's it for three up, three down, and now I'm gonna give a quick rundown of our EC Fantasy Baseball League standings coming into today. So this does not include today's numbers. But we've got a really tight uh, six teams uh, at the top of this league right now. Um, Fred McGriffey Sr. is in first place right now, as he was last time we went through the standings a couple weeks ago. But things have gotten much tighter. Um, The Shockers, 15 points back. Who's that? Made a huge jump last week with a 163-point day. 
uh, that just blew my projected innings total out of the water. But uh, the matchups were too good to pass up, and it it resulted in a, a huge day. Um, so the Shockers right there uh, in second place, 15 points behind. Morris Buttermaker at number three. Yeah! Is uh has also been on on a, a tear lately. A couple real big point producing days has got him up to the top of the league. Uh, Morris Buttermaker managed by our buddy Z. He's thirty six points out of first place. Uh, we got Dave Bandick in fourth place, fifty points back, and he's also his team's also made some some moves up the standings. Odeno Sunny. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Fifth place. Who we got in fifth place, JP? Barkeep. <laughs> Joe Boo needs a refill. Coming off a 126-point day yesterday. That's right. I beefed it up. Uh, moved right up, uh, I, I think, a couple spots, right? You moved up a couple spots there? Or I at did. Least I, was in, uh, I was in seventh. You're in seventh, so you're in fifth after that day, and you're 88 points back, which is that's a good spot to be in at this point of the season. Uh, Gianna's All-Stars, the commish, with in sixth place, 93 points back. And then there's a little bit of a drop-off to the next tier of uh, of standings. Let's see, we've got Westside Polacks at 209, our buddy Lick. Uh, Robbie Danger, Stranger Danger, he's down 241 points. Made a big trade last week, a week or so ago. Um, Dave Bandick picking up some pretty big-name guys from Robbie, so... I don't know what Robbie has up his sleeve, but right now that trade looks like it's uh, it's helping Dave out, and Dave is is noticeably uh, making a move up the standing since that trade went through. So we'll see what happens there as time goes on. Uh, the Crawdads, led by Shohei Otani, 412 the points back. And the pitcher. The batter and the pitcher. And rounding out the league standings in 10th place, we got Caleb's team. 546 points back. Caleb did make some moves this week. He did. I saw he's he made alive. Some moves. His pulse, his pulse is beating. I was a little um, worried there. And I'll, I'll say, if you, <laughs> I like to watch. I, I watch every single day. I see what he does, just because. Now I'm curious, and uh, he's been scoring some points. There's been days where I get like a 20 point day, and I look down. And I'm like, oh, Caleb's got 72 points. All right, that's cool. And he's got fucking Patrick Corbin on his team. Oh yeah, the guys yeah. like that. So. Francisco Lindor. He's got some good players. He's got good players. He's got pieces to trade. He's going to be a piece that you want to you want to pick apart at the trade deadline this year. You got to go look at Caleb's team. So that's the roundup of the EC Fantasy Baseball League. If you care. We will certainly keep you posted throughout the season with our antics and fun in that league. So uh, we're yeah. gonna have an all star break, uh, all star break party. I we think. should, yeah. An we should get all those, we'll all those it. guys. If any of you guys are listening, Dave, uh, Leo, Robbie, uh, any of you guys, you just named off like our our three most popular listeners. <laughs> there you go. That's why I mentioned. It. I figured there, there's actually a chance they might be listening. Um, we got to get you guys on the show. Come down and and we'll uh, we'll talk some baseball and and go over some of our fantasy baseball stuff in. Uh, and get into it. You guys got to come on the show anytime. Get a hold of us. Sunday night baseball. Currently bottom of the eighth out there in Anaheim, California. The Yankees lead the Angels two to one. Ooh, that's a close one. All right, so I think it's seventh inning stretch time, JP. It is definitely seventh inning stretch time. I am tired. I spent an awful lot of time on the New York State Thruway today. Um, not. An ideal way to spend a Sunday, and not not on a day like this either. Just it's nasty weather out there, and a nice day going for a little drive. It's a little bit more tolerable than having to drive through snow and rain on the throughway. I agree. In April, in April, April twenty ninth, still snowing. Yeah, your your weekly snow update brought to you by one eight hundred. Go fuck this weather. <laughs> Uh, it is still currently snowing still in snowing. Utica, New York. Uh, I apologize for any children tuning in tonight that heard the expletive that just came out of my mouth. And hey, we're late tonight. They might hear the recording, but uh, I think you're safe right now. All right, now. so we got to go back and <laughs> beep out the F word. <laughs> so tonight's seventh inning stretch, we're going to uh, rank our top seven shortstops currently playing in Major League Baseball. And uh, JP and I both prepared separate lists, and we'll 
you know, discuss each pick a little bit. And uh, we'll give you our, our top seven shortstops, and then uh, we're going to head out of here. So I'll give it a start, and I'll give you my number seven shortstop. It's Corey Seager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And that was that was a tough one for me um, because there's a couple other guys that I, I really like, uh, shortstops, Elvis Andrews and Gene Segura, that I had to leave off this list just because there are so many good top-end shortstops right now. Uh, but I ended up deciding to go with, with Seager, and admittedly a lot of that still is considering potential. Uh, he's off to a little bit of a slow start this year, but you know, he is a, a really gifted ball player, and he's going to be a good player for a long time. So I got Corey Seager of the Dodgers at number seven. Corey Seager, number seven. My number seven is somebody that you just said that you couldn't, you know, you, you almost couldn't leave off your list, but you did. Um, and I got Gene Segura of uh, the Seattle Mariners. Um, currently hitting 300. He's off to a pretty good start. Um, you know, two home runs, 20 RBIs, five steals. Steals is where you're going to get uh, with Gene Segura. You're going to get steals and um, and runs scored. Solid pop, too. 20 runs scored right now um, in five steals. You know, 2013, uh, 44 steals. 2014, 20 steals. 25 steals and 15 uh, 2016, 33 steals. Last year, 22 steals, 45 RBI, 11 home runs, um, you know, 300 batting average. Now, we didn't make our list based off of this year. He's having a, a really good year this year so far. Um, but, you know, last year hit 300. Two years ago, hit 319. Uh, this guy's been around for the last last few years and I think, you know, deserves mentioning inside of the top seven um, you look at lists like MLB.com runs down there, uh, or MLB Network, uh, apologize. They run down their shredder, uh, mm -hmm. is what they call it. Um, sometimes I, 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 sometimes I got to call bullshit on that, on that <laughs> shredder, um, because they didn't have Gene Segura in that. I, t I, you know, that's a top 10 list and we got them inside or really close to our, our top seven. You list. would absolutely um, be in my top 10 if this list stretched out to 10 spots. You, you would probably be number eight, honestly. Um, so I got Segura at number seven. I really like uh, I like his style of play. I like what he brings to the table for the Seattle Mariners. So I have Gene Segura. Number six. My number six is Trey Turner of the Washington Nationals. Another stolen um, base guy. Major, big-time stolen base <laughs> guy. In fact, right now uh, he's got 12 stolen bases and he has not been caught once yet this season uh he's batting 268 right now on base percentage 369 um he's not doing much for power uh but he can he he can hit home runs he's got some pop to him too um i think before the season's done you'll see him somewhere in the you know barring injury in the 15 to 20 home run range in maybe upwards of 60 70 stolen bases and of course that's Assuming he does not get hurt because he's had some injury issues in uh, in his young career. And 60 to 70 bases in today's game is the equivalent of 100. It's and, insane. It's 130. You know, we're talking about we're talking about 130, 140 steal type year in the 80s, 70s when stolen bases were a little more prevalent. Um, 60 or 70 in today's game is a lot. That is a lot. He's got 12 in 28 games right now. So you figure that that probably is, you know, without doing the math, that's probably in that 60 to 70 uh, steal pace right now. Um, so Trey Turner is my number six. Uh, my number six, um, I'm going to go, you know, this guy's having a good, uh, a good year so far. Uh, last year had an outstanding year at the plate. Um, but – we're talking about shortstops here, and that's the the linchpin on any team's defense. And we're going to talk about one of the best defenders, uh, although he's having a great year and a great last couple of years uh, from the plate. Uh, Andrelton Simmons of the Los Angeles Angels, um, all around shortstop. I think that he ranks inside. He ranks inside my top six, uh, if that's any indication. But we're talking about all around play as a shortstop. And if we're talking about both sides of the ball, Andrelton Simmons has to be on a list of shortstops. It's easy to get kind of lost in some of these offensive numbers because some of them are so eye-popping. There's there's um, positions on the field where the offensive numbers far outweigh the defensive numbers in terms of developing who's the best. All right, if we're going to talk about first baseman, defense, 
I mean, defensive first baseman are something that I, I enjoy, all right? But, you know, it's not the first thing. If the guy hits 50 homers and drives in 120 runs every year, but he plays an awful first base, he's still going to be considered amongst one of the best first basemen. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it warrants mentioning uh, for the guys that are, you know, among the lead, the league's best uh, on the other side of the ball because that is such an important position uh, for defenders. Um, but right now, I mean, he's hitting 315, three homers, 15 RBIs, two steals. Um, really good year last year for the Angels. Uh, you know, hit 278. Kind of a resurgence year for him. Um, you know, nobody really expected him to have the, the kind of year he had last year. 19 steals, 14 homers, 69 RBIs. Um, you know, for somebody that was traditionally – uh, uh, known as just a defender, mm-hmm. you know, he finished eighth in the MVP voting last year, uh, won, won another gold glove, his third gold glove. Um, so, Andrelton Simmons, uh, that's my number six guy. So, coming in at number five for me, uh, I have Xander Bogarts of the Boston Red Sox, uh, another one of the many good young shortstops in the game today. Uh, he's off to – he's missed some time with injury. He actually missed uh, an extended period of time so far this season. So he's only played 11 games, but he's batting 391, uh, OPS over 1,000. Um, he's got a couple homers. Uh, he's he's putting up the numbers in the games that he has played. And something to note, too, is you know the Red Sox started slipping a little bit uh, last week or so. They lost three in a row at one point. Um that was all while Xander Bogarts was was out. Uh so he's come back in. They have lost a couple of the games he's played since, but he's he's hitting. He's producing in those games. He's three for four and uh got a hit and a couple RBIs uh yesterday too in that loss to Tampa Bay. Um but yeah, he is a key part of that lineup in in not just this year, but for many, many years to come. Six years in the league. Um you know, he's been a solid performer every year in the league. But six years in the league, his uh, 162-game averages work out to be 14 homers, 75 RBIs, uh, 285 hitter, um, 49 walks, which isn't really the number that you want to see for somebody that's going to be, you know, up towards uh, up towards the top of your lineup, 128 strikeouts. So the strikeout numbers are a little alarming there. Uh, but 14 homers, 70 RBIs, 10 steals, uh, and 100 runs scored. That's His numbers were down last year, but sure. he, he was playing, uh, I guess, with an injury for a majority part of the Still season. Still stole 15 bags last year, drove in 62 runs and hit 10 homers. And that's if you got that at shortstop combined with, uh, you know, being a, not a gold glove winner, but, you know, a gold glove caliber, um, you're not going to win one in the American League with the crop that we're, you know, we're about to mention. Um, it's just not a realistic possibility of cracking in and winning a gold glove in the American League at shortstop. But, um, you know, he's a good defender. He's got some decent speed. Uh, Xander Bogart. So that's your number five. Xander Bogart. That's right. Got him high, I think. But I left him off the list. Sorry for any any Red Sox fans out there. So you're <laughs> not going to – I'm not going to be revealing that card coming up here anytime soon. So if you're waiting in suspense for me to talk about Xander Bogart, you're going to be waiting a little while longer. <laughs> My number five, I got Corey Seager. You've already touched on on Corey Seager uh, a little bit. Uh, let's go over his 162 game averages. So basically, what his stats would track across a hundred uh, a typical 162 since he's been in the league four years. Um, you know, he averages 25 homers and 82 RBIs. All right, 26 homers in 2016 um, and 22 homers in 2017. Um, 105 runs scored in 2016 uh strikes out a little bit much but he's more a middle of the order guy uh so maybe not a table setter like a xander bogarts uh could be relied on being in in boston um but more so a, a middle of the order guy but Corey seager um just to echo what you said um i got him i got him as my number five so you said he's been in the league for four years too four years and uh he just turned 24 two days ago so that tells you how young he was when he was called up uh, to become a a regular um, with the Los Angeles Dodgers so you got Corey Seager there on to my number four D.D. Gregorius at number four what more can we say about D.D. I can can say more we have covered him quite a bit today I can say more about D.D. you know what I'll say about D.D. 
I have Didi as my number four. Okay. So, so we that's both, what I'll say about we Didi. We both have him as our number four shortstops in the game right now. There is no way that I don't. Everything inside me wants to say that he's the best shortstop in the game. And right now, right now, he very well could be. At this given moment right. in time on right a- now. On April 29th, 2018. Didi Gregorius is, is, is or may be the best shortstop in the game. Machado's off to a fantastic start, too. And we'll get to the, you know, obviously I'm sure he's on your list as well. And we're going to get to him in a, in a minute. And he's off to a great start, so not to discount the start that Manny Machado's off to. But right now, I mean, it's arguable that Didi Gregorius is, um, is the best in the game, so definitely merits – uh, the top four placement. Um, surprising side note, and we've already talked about all of DD's numbers, so we're not even going to get into that. But um, surprising side note is that MLB Network show with the top ten shortstops that they did earlier in the year. Not one single guy had, except Brian Kenny, I think, had him tenth. Had after the year that he had last year, not even one single guy had him in the top ten, and now I think that they're seriously rethinking their position. I would on, hope so on Didi Gregorius. Um, like you mentioned, my favorite thing about him is the smile. That's my favorite thing about the player. Not the home runs, not the RBIs, not all the other intangibles. It's the smile. Is he goes out every single day and he tries to make the team better. He tries to win and he tries to make the fans have a good experience. And um, Didi Gregorius, number four. With a bullet, with a bullet, because could end up being number one. He could end up at the end of this year, should this continue, and he goes off and, and puts himself in an MVP candidate conversation, Didi Gregorius is going to be considered one of the top. Oh, yeah, this, this could league. be it's a total, just, total it, different discussion a couple months from now. He's getting himself a payday for sure uh, right now. And there's a couple guys on this list that are working towards significant paydays. Um but Didi is one of them. Uh, so Didi and uh, and both of us, uh, we have Didi at number four. Uh, I'll let you go off with your number three. Got number three, Francisco Lindor. Another, I would have to assume that our top three. I think we're we're probably we're probably going to have our top three. The top three. Uh, and it really, any of these guys, you you can rank them in pretty much any any order, in my opinion. Um, right now, I, I've got Francisco Lindor as my number three. A um, little bit of a slow start by Francisco Lindor standards, but one of the elite young players in the game today. And, you know, in my opinion, a potential MVP caliber talent. Anderton Simmons and he are probably one in one A on the defensive side of the ball in, in Major League Baseball, maybe, but definitely in the American League. Anderton Simmons and, and, uh, and this guy. I certainly would, wouldn't uh, argue that point. Um, so I've got Lindor as my number three. Uh, I I don't argue that point at all. Um, with Lindor being in your top three, got him a little higher. Um, I have a guy out there in Houston who occupies uh, shortstop Carlos Correa. Um, obviously, been among the league best a- at the position for a few years here now. Um, but still very, very young. So I want to see how old he is because I forgot. All these guys are pretty young. And, you know, we, we've mentioned it time and time again. 23 years old. How all these young players in baseball, not just the shortstops, but, you know, the shortstops are a he huge part of He is 23 years old. 23 years old. He has 70 homers and 268 RBI. And he is 23 years old. 23. So he's on rookie contract right now. He's due a big payday as well, uh, making a million dollars this year. Talk about talk about value. <laughs> um, but Carlos Correa is an absolute machine. He's a machine. Um, you could have him anywhere one, two, three on your list, and I probably wouldn't argue with you. But if you have him outside of three on your list of best shortstops in the game right now, you're you're wrong. You just are. You're wrong. You look at these numbers, uh, especially the last two years. Um, you know, two seventy four, okay, not so bad. Twenty and ninety six with thirteen steals and eighty runs scored. Uh, twenty four and eighty four with with 
80 runs scored, 315, 391 on base percentage. Um, awesome numbers. So rookie of the year, his first year, 2015. Um, he was an all-star last year, uh, and deservedly so. Um, you know, small sample size on Carlos Correa, but um, what we have seen is definitely enough to merit having him in our, in our top three. Uh, and that's where he sits with me is at number three. I've got Cray as at number two, and you pretty much covered every point that I was thinking uh, when I ranked him number two. Um, you know, in an elite top level young major league shortstop that is a key part of one of the best teams in baseball, if not the best team in baseball. Um, and he's produced great numbers and it's easy to forget how young some of these guys are you said he was 23 years old it he, he just seems like a, an established veteran at this point but he's a 23 year old kid still putting up these numbers and there's no reason to think that those numbers aren't going to continue to get even better as hard as it, that is to imagine but I, I don't think it's out of the question to see him you know become a a regular 35 40 home run guy in a couple of years um, I mean look at what somebody like Robinson Cano did when he was a, a very young player he was coming up and he was hitting 18 to 20 home runs and then uh, once his power developed you know he's he was a 35 home run pop guy and I think with Correa already putting up these 25 30 home run seasons you could definitely see a jump in his stats uh, on top of what he's already doing so Carlos Correa my number two my number two is somebody that we've already spoken about, and like we said, we're all going to have the top three in, in maybe a different order, but it's all going to be the same top three. Speaking of young shortstops who are key pieces in the lineup for the best team in, in arguably the best team in baseball, um, you know, Francisco Lindor, 24 years old, a very key piece in one of the best teams on in, in baseball. So it's amazing how reoccurring this theme is with the best teams in baseball. We talk about the Red Sox and Bogarts, and we talk about the Angels and Simmons and Didi Gregorius and the Yankees and Lindor and Correa with, with the Indians and the Astros. All of the best teams in the majors have young, controllable shortstops. All of them. Um how important is this position? It's, it's fitting that of all the positions that we decided to do our seventh inning stretch with to start, we started with, with the shortstops. It's fitting. It's one of the most important positions on the field. But right now, in terms of the, the market value of baseball and the appeal of baseball, it's one of the most important positions in the game, period. Uh, and the young crop of talent, as evidenced by this list, is just a testament to where the game is uh, in terms of you know, value to the fans and value to anyone that lives and dies by this game is just look at the young crop of shortstops and tell me the game's not in a good place. All of these guys are under 25, 26 years old. I think Didi's 28, 27. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, but so speaking of young, controllable shortstops on good teams, I'm going to say Francisco Lindor is my number two. And drum roll, please. So I think that means we have the same number one ranked. I would have to believe shortstop that right we now. have the number one ranked shortstop. Now, had it been any other different year, we would have been having this guy probably at the top of our running down our third base list. But he's back to shortstop. He's back to this shortstop. Season. So you know we can end the suspense and both say that we got Manny Machado, Manny Machado. as the number one shortstop. You know, one in the thing game. that kind of blows me away about Manny Machado is he's been. This is his eighth. Major League season. His first his first year, he had uh, you know a little bit less than 200 at bats. But this is his eighth, I guess you could say seventh full Major League Baseball season. Age 25. He's younger than Aaron Judge. Yes. It seems like Manny Machado has been around forever. 19 years old. He's 25 years old right now. Yep. After he's having been in the majors, younger than Aaron Judge, who won six, seven rookie full of the year. seasons. Rookie of the year last year. He's younger than him, and he's been. Seven full seasons. That is a remarkable stat. Um, he's got nine homers, batting three sixty one, leading twenty two uh, RBIs, leading the major leagues in average. It's eleven seventeen OPS. 
And he's only struck out 16 times right now, too. And that's been a little bit of a problem for him. Not not like something extreme like what you see like Chris Davis or, uh, you know, Matt Davidson you mentioned. Uh, but he has kind of been a strikeout guy when he gets into these slumps a little bit. But this year he's walked more times than he's struck out. And he's actually stolen a couple bases, too. So it's 2018. And Manny Machado's 25. <laughs> and he exceeded rookie limits in 2012. Yeah. Yeah, what's that tell you how long he's already been around? And yeah. he is he is about to get paid. He's a free agent after the season. We um, might see our first pair anyway of we might see a pair of four hundred million dollar guys. That's very possible between well, Machado we are between Machado and Harper and Bryce Harper. We are definitely gonna see a forty million dollar year as a portion of one of these contracts. You're gonna see you know, a front loaded contract or a back loaded contract or or whatever. But you're going to see a $40 million full-value year in one of these contracts. Whether or not it's it's a 10-year, $400 million deal um, remains to be seen. But you're definitely going to see a $40 million year had by Machado. And if, if he continues on this pace, the sky's the limit. And Bryce Harper's having a great start to his season, too. So the sky's the limit for yeah, those both two those guys. in terms of contract and what they're going to get. So we're both just in a, agreement. Just uh, Manny Machado is the number one ranked shortstop currently in Major League Baseball. Tough to argue. I mean, it is. T- it, it wasn't tough to come up with this, this list. It was tough to make seven, you know, potentially trimming 11 guys down. In, you know, the Elvis Andruses, and, and I left Xander Bogarts off, and um, you had Anderson Simmons off, right? Trimming it down to that was the difficult part, but the game's in a good spot, especially at shortstop. Absolutely. It's, it's just at a good spot. So that's we didn't seventh name off, stretch. We didn't name off a Derek Jeter. We didn't name off somebody that had been holding down that position for a while. We just named off seven guys that, you know, they have a total of 34 years of experience between the seven guys, maybe. Um, and Manny Machado's got 10 of them. He's been playing since he was in junior high. Um just it's it's in such a great spot so that seventh inning stretch uh brought to you by priceless inspections a good quality home inspection is priceless call josh amodio at 315-525-8725 for your next home inspection in-depth and detailed reports thorough inspections and he pays attention to details josh has been in the construction business his whole life and he knows the importance of a quality home inspection call josh before you put your Go buy a house. If you're going to sell your house, you just want to update your house, Josh can do all that for you. Call him today, 315-525-8725. That's Priceless Inspections. Um, Also brought to you by Steep Ponte Volkswagen. Stop down to their showroom at 5046 Commercial Drive in Yorkville, New York. See why it's easy to do business with Steep Ponte Volkswagen. SteepPonteVolkswagen.net. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, before we go, we got to talk about the Cincinnati Reds situation. They just fired their manager, Brian Price. They're 20 games. 18, actually. 18 games. 18. Breaking the previous record set by the Cincinnati Reds, Marge Schott, who fired uh, a manager after 44 games. Tony Perez, uh, allowing Davey Johnson to take over. I believe that was 1989. 44 games was the previous record. It's now 18. Brian Price has been fired after 18 games in the season. Um, With that lineup, there's no way that you should get fired after 18 games. Uh, So where uh, where does that land Brian Price? Well, it lands him out of Cincinnati, and it also lands him out out of the the baseline. baseline. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. SPG and JP here on the baseline. Sorry for running so late and so long tonight. Check us out on the web, back episodes, and all of the other good content at disruptionnetwork.net. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch as well. We're happy to have you guys listen to us, and we will talk to you next week. And for now, keep it inside the baseline. Thanks, everybody. We're out.
forces to take real estate to the next level. We practice with honesty, integrity, and the knowledge to help make the buying and selling process easy and stress-free for all of our clients. We pledge to always make our clients our top priority from start to finish and even after the house is closed. We will always be a valued resource for information and assistance for our buyers and sellers. Our customers over the years have become not only past clients, but great friends. As we join hands together as the Property Sisters of the Mohawk Valley, we look forward to serving our clients and our community and making a positive difference. You can reach us at 315-601-9630 for all of your real estate needs. When it's your hard-earned money on the line that you are investing into a home, it makes sense to choose a proven professional to assist you in making one of the biggest investments you may ever make. Josh's dedication of over 20 years to the home construction industry allows him to bring knowledge and experience to your doorstep. That means you can feel confident and comfortable with his service to you. Past clients love his attention to detail and thorough written reports. By allowing priceless inspections to help you make a well-informed decision concerning your property, you will find that a quality inspection is priceless. Follow Priceless Inspections on Facebook or call 315-525-8725. Hi, this is attorney Nick Pasolacqua. The team of attorneys I have assembled at Pasolacqua & Associates has been carefully hand-picked to include the best trial attorneys in the particular areas of the law that we practice. Have you been charged with DWI or any other crime? Members of our team include former assistant district attorneys now fighting to protect your rights 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Have you or someone you love been seriously injured in a motor vehicle accident? Members of the team at Pasolacqua & Associates include former insurance defense attorneys now fighting to ensure that you get every penny you're entitled to. If you need legal help quick, don't waste your time or money calling anyone else. Remember, for legal help quick, you better call Nick and the team at Pass Lock One Associates, 315-500-NICK or 315-500-6425 or visit cnytriallaw.com today. 